of the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors to order. My name is the Bill Gates. The is now Ooh. starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Welcome to this special meeting of the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors. I'm Bill Gates. I'm the chairman uh, of, of the board. And uh, today we're very pleased to be joined up on the dais by Maricopa County recorder, Stephen Richer. Uh, Stephen, thanks for joining us. And the reason that Stephen is with us today is that we are uh, taking this opportunity uh, to discuss a lot of work that's been done by our elections department. And the elections department is a joint operation of the recorder's office and the board of supervisors. And we, uh, today, you're gonna have the opportunity to hear uh, in detailed fashion the findings of members of the elections department who have examined in painstaking detail uh, the results that came from the Senate inquiry uh, last year with regard to the 2020 uh, November election. I wish that we were not still here discussing the 2020 election, but unfortunately, uh, the State Senate, uh, working with their contractors, have decided to go through a detailed process um, uh, to come up with certain conclusions. And today, you're gonna have an opportunity to hear what our folks in the Elections Department have done to get into the details of each one of the accusations from the Cyber Ninjas. They claim that there were 53,000 questionable ballots in the November 2020 election. You're gonna hear something different today and it's gonna be based in fact. Now it's my hope that this will be the last word on the November 2020 election because you're gonna hear the facts today in detail. And when this, is, when this hearing is over, the nearly 100-page report that has been prepared by the Elections Department will be on just the facts.vote. So you can go there, review it on your own. So with that, uh, I am going to turn to Scott Jarrett, who's our co-director of elections here in Maricopa County. And Scott, you're gonna lead us through uh, the presentation. I hope you don't mind. I think there may be some questions um, from those of us up here on the dais, but thank you to you and the entire team for the painstaking work that was put into this. I also wanna acknowledge Tom Liddy, who's here from the Maricopa County Attorney's Office. Very, very grateful uh, for the county attorney's involvement in this process as well. I think earlier I saw Assessor Eddie Cook in the room. I'm not sure if he's here anymore, uh, but, but I appreciate him being here as well. So with that, I'll turn it to Scott Jarrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, the Maricopa County Recorder. Um, today, we're here to present our findings related to the Senate's inquiry in Mar of Maricopa County's administration of the 2020 general election. As you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the public that are following online can download a copy of our findings in a nearly 100-page report on justthefacts.vote and also on justthefacts.vote are all the exhibits that are included to support our analysis. Now, this, this report and our, uh, our summary and presentation is really focused on three documents. There was three uh, reports issued by Senate contractors. Uh, the first was volume three of the Cyber Ninjas report. That also included uh, te technical uh, our findings related and claims related to uh, our tabulation equipment produced by Cypher. And then we're also uh, responding to claims in an echo mail report and then the Senate's machine count report. So those are the three reports that we'll be reviewing, what our analysis really focused on and um, what our, our findings are related to that analysis. Um, today with me, I have Nate Young. He is the recorder's chief information officer. Uh, he supports the elections department um, and his team does from an IT perspective. I also, we also have Janine Petty. Uh, she is the Senior Voter Registration Director 
with the recorder's office, and we have Celia Nabor, who is the assistant director for early voting within the elections department. And each of us will be presenting uh, the findings within the areas that we oversee and are responsible for. Mr. Jarrett, if you just before you proceed, I wanted to make sure that everyone knew that our other colleague, uh, Steve Gallardo, is on the phone right now. So he's participating. I'm sure he'll have questions as this goes forward. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So before we get into the actual findings of our report, I did th think it was important that we go back and review where we came from and really November 2020 general election and why the elections department is confident in the integrity of the, of the election that we administered and that we know that the results were reliable, secure, transparent, and accurate. Now, I'm not going to go into and provide an exhaustive, exhaustive list of all of those items because it would take us too long to go through. But if individuals do want to go and see a very thorough review of that, they can go to our board presentation for the Canvas that occurred on November 20th, 2020, where we went through in detail all items related to accountability, related to the accuracy of our equipment, related to the statutory audits that were required to be done, related to the security, related to chain of custody records. It was nearly a three hour presentation where we, on the record, before the board voted to approve the canvas, we reviewed and we answered nearly every question that existed at that point in time related to the November 2020 general election. But there are a few points that I do want to highlight. And those include things related to reliability and how we know that the system is reliable. And one of those is, based on state law, Maricopa County, as with all counties in Arizona, are required to use federally certified and state certified tabulation equipment. And before that equipment can be certified, it requires extensive testing by a certified voting system testing laboratory. So, and those, those laboratories are certified through NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and they go through a robust set of tests to make sure that they're reliable. They also go through extensive accuracy tests. I wanted to point out that before they will certify a piece of equipment, they test to make sure that it is 99.9998% accurate. So yes, that is uh, three nines followed by an eight. Um, before they will certify that equipment. So if there's out of uh, 125,000 votes cast, if there's more than one that it incorrectly calculates, they will not certify that equipment. The reason I wanted to highlight that is there's been a lot of information out there about hand counts. And as um, any election official knows, and as the Cyber Ninjas proved, the hand counting process takes a very long time and is, uh, can be very inaccurate at, at, at times. So the, using this system, this equipment, a highly calibrated certified piece of equipment is how one of the ways we know that the election was run with integrity, that voters can, tr can trust and count on and rely on the results of the election. One other thing that I wanted to point out is we just didn't rely on these voting system tested laboratories through the federal certification process. We, before we purchased this equipment and finalized the contract, we did a pilot and stress test. And part of that pilot and stress test was in November 2019, we conducted a election for the Madison School District. And for that election, we went through and did 100% hand count on every ballot and what we found it, through that hand count process is that the hand count matched the election equipment with 100% accuracy. Also, one other way we th know that the election results are done with integrity and reliability is when we are administering the election, we hire members from every political party to work for us. So when we're out at every vote center, you will find members of the Republican Party, members of the Democratic Party, members of the Libertarian Party at some of the voting locations, members that are from that are not with the party, they're independents, our party not declared. 
And those are the checks and balances. They are that final line of defense to make sure that those processes are run with integrity. They hold each other accountable. But we don't just hire those political party representatives at our voting locations. They're present throughout the entire process. Every central board that we hire is made up of members of different parties. All the workers that we hire in our warehouse are made up of central part, our multiple parties. Um, this is, and they, if you look around, if you're watching this, and you think about your neighbors in your communities, these are the individuals that we hire that come to work from us. They are our community. This election isn't just administered by the elections department. It's administered by the community of Maricopa County. Now there's a few other items that I'd like to highlight and those are related to security. And one thing is we keep, so everything that we do within the elections department, we're very important. It's very important to us to make sure that it is transparent. And so we have cameras, live streaming cameras throughout the elections department. This is every time we're handling ballots processing ballots, moving ballots, counting ballots. It is all live streamed on our website. So members of the public can go to the Maricopa County Elections Department website and view every action that we take. Now statute requires us to just have that during an election. We keep those cameras live 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So right now you can go to our website and view those cameras. A few other items related to, to security. So when we have our tabulation equipment, it is within our custody, in our very secure facility. So we keep a complete record of every time that we access the, this equipment. But we, there are times where we do have to send out tabulation equipment that we do, that's not within our facility. And those are our precinct-based tabulators. So we will send those out to voting locations to count ballots on election day. How we maintain security and custody of those ballots or those tabulation, that tabulation equipment when it's off-site is through tamper evidence seals. And we keep a very thorough accounting of what seals are affixed. They have little serial numbers that get attached to each of those tabulators. Um, we keep logs and records of that. We ask our poll workers, those bipartisan teams, once they receive that, tabula that tabulation equipment on-site at the voting location, one of their first jobs to do is to verify that it's the exact equipment that we sent out, that those seals match. They get a report. They sign off on that report um, at the beginning of their shift, and then they sign off on again at the end of the shift when they actually do have to break one of those seals to remove the memory card with those results that they're going to return to us, and they're going to return it in a team of two, members of different parties. So that's how we know, or some of the reasons we know that our election is secure. Scott, oh wow. <laughs> are, are you going to go into tabulation later or is now the appropriate time to ask additional questions about tabulation? If you're going to go into it in more depth later, I'll ask later. Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richer, I will be um, discussing tabulation later, but now is a good time. Uh, okay, so I just want to, for clarification purposes, there are there is a precinct-based tabulator for every voting location in Maricopa County, correct? Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richer, that is correct. And in the November 2020 general election, we actually sent out two precinct-based tabulators to every voting location for redundancy purposes um, and also to address some of the concerns that we had related to COVID-19. And so we weren't creating a bottleneck. Okay, so you have the precinct-based tabulators and then you have the nine central count tabulators that were present during the November 2020 election, right? That's correct. And what percentage approximately did those about the, those tabulators, those central count, those central count tabulators count. So, Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richer, uh, about 92 percent of all ballots cast in Maricopa County were tabulated on our central count okay. tabulators. So, the central count tabulators are doing 92 percent of the tabulation in the November 2020 election. Now, with respect to those central count tabulators, you said what? They first have to be federally standard certified. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richer, that's correct. But also the precinct-based tabulators. And well. whom, again, do they have to be federally certified by? So uh, they have to be federally certified, are certified by a 
accredited voting system testing laboratory certified through the United States Elections Assistance Commission. And the Elections Assistance Commission reports to the President of the United States and is named by five commissioners who are both Republican and Democrat. And this is the body that says you have to be 99.998% accurate, correct? 99.999. Okay, I missed a nine in there. And so that's the body. And without that certification, we can't use those tabulators, right? That's correct. And we also require state-based certification, correct? That's correct. Okay, so first it has to go through those certifications. Now, was the 2020, November 2020 election the first time that these tabulators were used? That's, that was not the first time that we used the tabulation equipment. How many times had those specific tabulators, those exact tabulators, been used in elections prior to the November 2020 election? It was the fifth official election that they we were used to canvass the results of the election. So the exact same tabulators were used for four elections prior to the November 2020 election, correct? That's correct. And for each of those elections, they had to what? Undergo a logic and accuracy test, is that right? A logic and accuracy test before and after the election. And correct me if I'm wrong, but a logic and accuracy test is essentially taking a stack of ballots for which we know the correct outcome, feeding it through those tabulators and making sure that the tabulators feed back the answer that we already know is accurate, correct? Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richard, mostly correct. Okay. So um, for a uh, election that contains a federal contest or a statewide contest on that, the logic and accuracy test is also completed by the Secretary of State's office. So they will complete a set of ballots that is unknown to us as in the elections department, and then they will run them through the tabulators and then verify that those results from those pre-field ballots completed by a separate independent party match the results. Okay, so the accuracy of the tabulators that was tested in four prior elections was not even done independently by Maricopa County, but had the input of the Secretary of State, a third party. Now, was there also, were there any hand count audits done by the political parties in any of those four elections prior to the November 2020 election? Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richard, there were two hand counts completed in the contest that had a federal contest or a statewide contest on the ballot. Okay, so can our, you... our March presidential preference election and the August primary election. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. In those hand count audits, those are done by members of three, three people who are assigned by the political party, so you'll have a Republican and Democrat on every hand count audit board, and they go through and they count in what, stacks of 10, and they make sure that, that those results match what the machines spit out? That's correct. They are The hand counts are not completed by us. They are completed by the political parties based on appointees that are appointed from the chairman of each of the county political parties. And from these two hand counts, these four logic and accuracy tests, and these four elections prior to the November 2020 election, were there any signs of inaccuracy? Were there any allegations leveled by any of the political parties? And were there any concerns that the tabulators were not functioning as they should prior to the November 2020 election? No, there were none. And in the hand counts themselves, in not only the November 2020 general election, but the August primary and the March presidential preference, the political parties found that the tabulation equipment was 100% accurate. Now, would these same tabulation equipment have been used for the August 2020 primary that ultimately led to candidates participating in the November 2020 election? Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richard, that's correct. Okay. So now, if you don't mind, I'll turn to the actual November 2020 election. Now, my understanding is that there was a logic and accuracy test done both before the election and after the election. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And what was the result of that? those logic and accuracy tests? They found that the tabulation equipment um, accurately tabulated the ballots as intended. Okay, so if I had manipulated the machine after the, somehow, manipulated the machines after the pre-election logic and accuracy tests, such that it would switch candidates from one candidate to another, that would presumably be revealed in the post-election logic and accuracy test, correct? That is correct, and that's the, one of the purposes for that post election logic and accuracy test. Were the political parties invited to the pre-election logic and accuracy test and the post-election logic and accuracy test? Yes, they were. 
Now, did Maricopa County participate in a hand count audit of the November 2020 election? Yes, we did. And again, that hand count audit consisted of volunteers appointed by the political parties such that Republicans were equal participants in the hand count audit, correct? That's correct. So Maricopa County did not perform the hand count audit, but oversaw the hand count audit done immediately after the 2020 election that was conducted in groups of three in bipartisan groups, including Republicans, correct? That's correct, and I would like to make a point because one piece of misinformation that I've heard is that Maricopa County selected the ballots that were to be hand counted in the hand count, and that's not true. Uh, the political parties themselves select the ballots as we're going through the tabulation process, and they make sure that there's ballots, the political party appointees make sure that there's ballots selected from every machine um, that's used in central count, and then they're randomly selected and drawn for inclusion in, as required by state law, uh, for the hand count process. Okay, thank you. And it's my understanding that approximately 47,000 votes were, were counted during the bipartisan, Republican included, post-election hand count audit, is that correct? That's correct. And what was the result of that hand count audit in terms of how closely did it match what the machines counted? So the political parties found that it matched 100%. And when that number was revealed, was there any hullabaloo? Was there any consternation from any of the people who participated in the hand count audit? So no, there was no concerns. You didn't use hullabaloo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were no concerns, okay, thank you. So all of those tests have been performed and it was the same tabulation equipment in summary that underwent five elections, three hand count audits, and six logic and accuracy tests if by my account. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Is now an appropriate time to talk about the tabulation software vendor, Dominion, or will that be addressed later? Maybe we could, Mr. Richard, maybe we can, I, I just wanna be careful that okay. we're, we're making sure we're, we're getting, we've got four folks up here, so. That will be your task for the day to, <laughs> there, to hold me back, all right, thank you. Okay, ex thank you, outstanding questions. Mr. Jarrett. So, Mr. Chairman, just a few more items related to that Canvas presentation and leading up to the November uh, 2020 general election. Uh, the, the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors on, in June of 2019 took back extra, their statutory responsibility of the Elections Department in partnership with the Maricopa County Recorder, uh, Mr. Adrian Fontes at that time. Uh, as part of the mandate that the Board of Supervisors established, they wanted to have as transparent as possible elections. This was not just a result of COVID-19, it was they wanted the, the public to know every piece, every nut and bolt, how we get from A to Z of an election process. So we had numerous hearings throughout that entire process as we went into the March presidential preference election, how we were planning. We produced for the first time ever planning documents, election day plans, early voting plans. These plans included how we would tabulate had ballots, it included how we would hire and recruit poll workers, it included how we would train poll workers, all of the information that the public would need to have confidence in the election process. But we also, in addition to that, we had town halls. We met with the public to inform them of the election process leading up into the November 2020 election. We also had frequent reporting of results once election night came. And this is important because one of the things that builds distrust in the elections of the processes, the longer it takes to count ballots. And one of, in Arizona, we can't release results before 8 p.m. on election night. So after that port, as part of our plan to release results, we reported results at least daily thereafter until the final ballots were cast on November 13th. And some of those times we reported results twice so we can get through and process those ballots in a timely fashion and in an accurate reporting fashion. And then one other thing that I wanna highlight as well is I was going to discuss in some of the detail the logic and accuracy tests, but I just answered many of those different questions. But we also had two certified voting system testing laboratories. So this was above and beyond what's required 
through statute and something that we didn't cover in the November 2020 general election canvas because we did this in February. So based on questions that we had heard um, from the public about concerns about the administration of the election, we hired these two voting system testing laboratories to come in and confirm that first vote switching couldn't occur. They performed a logic and accuracy test on, on their own as well, based on their expertise. They confirmed that our tabulation equipment was not connected to the internet and had not been connected to the internet. They confirmed that we were using certified, not only equipment, but the software on that tabulation was certified. So again, going back to that 99.9998% accuracy of the equipment. They confirmed that we were using that same software on the equipment, and they also confirmed that the equipment had not been hacked and that there was no malware. So those were some of the steps that we took to make sure that we had. So, so sorry to interrupt, just a question on that. Maybe you can explain to folks, because you hit on, I think, an extremely important point, which is that the independent group came in and said, our election machines were never connected to the internet. How did they come to that conclusion? What evidence, I mean, did they just say it or what What was the basis for that statement, which I think is extremely important? So Mr. Chairman, they were able to go through and do a forensic audit of our equipment. So they, were, they went through all of our logs and they were able to go all the way back to when we first set up the equipment and determine that there, and if it had connected to the internet, it would leave a trace, right? It would create a log within our log files that would identify, okay, this equipment connected to the internet. They were also able to go and test the current setup that it was a true isolated network, an air gap network, that when they went through and they would attempt, they would try to ping the internet and it wouldn't, it would fail. And then they'd be able to see that failure in the logs. And one of the voting system testing laboratories actually identified one instance, a log, that when one of our, our team members, our ballot tabulation team members, typed in brightness into the search function within the system, it went out and tried to ping the internet because we're using a Microsoft product and that Microsoft product as a standard piece of equipment and that function tries to use the, the software Bing and it failed. And they were able to confirm that, that we had no internet connectivity through their, their expertise and their detailed review. Thank you. Can we harp on that just a little bit more? I'm sorry, just because this was three of my first nine weeks in audit in office were spent auditing the tabulation equipment by our own two independent auditors. And this isn't something that was statutorily required, correct? Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richer, um, that's correct. It's not required. And I would say that they're not our own auditors. We did hire them and procure them, but they were independent auditors from, that were certified, these certified voting system testing laboratories. Independent auditors, because much of the noise, much of the concern was again surrounded on these pieces of tabulation equipment. Because before we started hearing about irregular ballots, it was all about Dominion and the tabulation machines. And so I think it's incredibly unfair when people say that the County Board of Supervisors was unresponsive to some of these concerns because I remember getting in, speaking with members of the Arizona Senate and many members of the general public who are politically involved, and they said the tabulators, the tabulators, dominion, dominion. And so I turned to my colleagues here, well, most of them here, and it, it was they who said, we agree even though it is not statutorily required, we are going to hire two companies to come in and independently assess this tabulation equipment. Now, importantly, they didn't just go through the list of their donors or the list of names on their cell phones, but they went to seasoned, long-standing elections technologies companies that are federally certified in this type of operation. Now, another thing that has been said about this is that this was simply another logic and accuracy test, which is a malicious canard that is absolutely not true. To that end, did they open up the tabulation equipment during this three-week period in which they assessed the tabulation equipment? Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richard, that, yes, they did. Did they check the logs of computer events during that three-week period? Yes, they did. 
Okay. So this was not just a let's run another deck of ballots through the tabulation equipment by any stretch of the imagination. That's correct. They thoroughly went through and reviewed our equipment. They took off all, as Nate Young, our information technologist, Technology director would say the chassis or the external pieces of it's the cases that the, are in the computers and they use their expertise to look through bit by bit and chip by chip to make sure that that equipment was configured, programmed correctly and not connected to the internet. And those reports from those two independent technologies companies are available on just the facts stop vote as well? That's correct. Thank you. And, and Mr. Jarrett, I think that it's also important to note that while these audits were being done, we had invited members from the Senate President's office, the Speaker of the House's office, the AG's office, and the Governor's office to come and witness what was going on and ask any questions they had of the people doing the audits while they were happening. Thank you, Mr. Jarrett. Thank you for allowing me to go down memory road of the November 2020 general election. Now we'll move on to providing a summary of our findings related to the Senate's inquiry in our 2020, uh, our administration of the 2020 uh, general election. So we reviewed 75 total claims that were included in those three documents that I mentioned, the Cyber Ninjas Volume 3 report, the Echo Mail report, and the Senate Machine Count report. And we found that nearly every one of those claims was inaccurate. We found 38 of those claims precisely were inaccurate, misleading, 25 of those claims were misleading, and 11 were false. And we've gone through and categorized these in these different categories. And an inaccurate claim is an instance of when uh, we found that the cyber ninjas or the Senate's contractors uh, either used a incorrect or faulty methodology, or they lacked an understanding of a federal or state law as they were performing their analysis. So pretty much every one of these findings um, that were related to impacted ballots, those 53,000 ballots that were 53,000 ballots that were mentioned earlier, those were all found to be inaccurate. A misleading claim is when uh, the report may have found and reported on something accurate, but they portrayed it or they wrote the report in a way that would lead the reader to come to a faulty conclusion or a conclusion that, that something was done, uh, not done according to state law. And a good example of a misleading claim is in one of, in their report on uh, on when we're talking about uh, connections to the internet, they include two different servers, uh, as they state that these two different servers connected to the internet. And that's actually true. Those two servers did connect to the internet. But they're reporting on two servers that report, that support the elections department and the recorder's office website. So as part of the subpoenas, we were required to provide, and these are Reb, our RE Web 01, RE Web, or you'll have to get the numbers right, Nate. REweb 1601 and REGIS 1202. So those two servers, we provided clones of those servers to satisfy the Senate subpoena because in the subpoena they had asked for the equipment that had connected to the voter registration database. Well, we those do connect through a secure system that we set up. They can describe that. Um, but because we have to be able to allow voters to look up their voter registration information, those servers have to connect to the website. But what they didn't say was those servers are not, don't have anything to do with our tabulation equipment and that isolated air gap system. So we determined that those conclusions were misleading. And then there were false claims that we found that based on the... Supervisor, Supervisor Hickman. Scott. Um, just, you mentioned the word I'm waiting to hear the definition on, um, air-gapped system. In the Cyber Ninjas report, how deep did their report go into what they were looking at in an air-gapped system versus what you're describing, the servers that talk to the county or the, the servers that we have to continue to keep voter registration uh, up to date, because that came up in the that came up in the 
all, all of the, um, not just the general, but, but presidential preference, uh, the primary election, people's records they feel need to be updated. It's by law. And uh, so tell me the definition of an air gap system because I, I keep looking, a picture with a thousand words means everything to me. Guess I'm an old farmer. I look at pictures and go, that makes sense. I keep seeing the picture of the system encapsulated in a glass box. I keep seeing pictures of all the wiring running on runways, not in the walls. And I'm just thinking, when is this going to, that almost speaks for itself of what an air gap system is. So you just mentioned air gap. What's an air gap system? And why is this important to this entire report? So, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman, an air gap system is an isolated network that's not connected to the internet or any other networks. It's only connected to the components within that system. And actually, Mr. Nate Young will have a slide later on that shows the network diagram of the air gap system. And this a diagram has been made available through justthefacts.vote. Also, as part of this report, we have it, that diagram included as well. Well, Mr. Chairman, because I've, I've heard from several legislature, uh, legislators that have taken the tour, and they look at that the, for the very first time, they look at that glass box, and they look at that tabulation center, and you can see a light going off. Like, this is what you're talking about. And I just wish we could bring every Maricopa County taxpayer through it. I wish we could. I know we have the 24-7 cameras on it all the time, but you really get the sense of what an air gap system is when you see what this county has done over a number of years to establish this system and to secure this system. So, sorry, sorry Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. And Mr. Chair. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman, we do have a... Uh, security video, a uh, fill in the blank security video that's currently, if you go to be ballot ready, it's posted on that, that link as well as just the facts that you can go through and watch. You, uh, Supervisor Hickman, you were describing uh, how we have the racking and the exposed wiring that you could trace every wire from every piece of equipment to that server and that video demonstrates that very well. So the last claims, our category of claims that we identified were the false claims, and there were 11 of those. And these were when we, the information that we provided, the Senate contractors should have been able to determine just with the information that was provided, they didn't need election expertise to determine that their claim was false or not included in their, their report. And a good example of this is the paper bleed through. So in their report, they include a finding related to saying that we didn't use 80 pound vote secure paper because they had found ballots with bleed through on them. And that 80 pound vote secure paper doesn't allow bleed through. And that is false. And we know that's false because we as an elections department, we've done extensive testing. However, a simple query with the manufacturer themselves would also confirm that. So we didn't just rely on all the extensive testing that we did when we were testing for accuracy, um, making sure that because bleed through can happen, we have offsetting ovals and making sure that that's not impacting the tabulation results as you go through and you tabulate those ballots if bleed through is occurring. Um, but so we sent a email and that is included as one of our exhibits in this report, um, that email and the response from the manufacturer. And in that response, they confirmed that the vote secure paper that we procured does allow for bleed through and they actually tested it themselves. And in that there's a picture where they used a Sharpie pen, they wrote hello on the front of the ballot and then they showed an image of the back of the ballot and you could see clearly see the word hello. So this is a claim that clearly can be identified. Uh, you don't need to be an elections expert. If you're going through and just over the standard course, if you were performing a audit, an unbiased audit, you would have gone through and tried to find 
uh, factual evidence to support your claim. And part of that factual evidence would have been reaching out to the manufacturer to find out if that, if that paper would prevent bleed through, something that they didn't do. So the reason why nearly every claim that they found was either inaccurate, faulty, or misleading was because of either inaccurate methodologies, and I do have a few examples of those. So one of those is using soft data matching techniques. So in the one claim that they identified, the Cyber Ninjas identified in the report about the number of ballots, there was 23,000 ballots that they identified as being impacted or questionable because voters had moved. So that was the only claim that they identified as critical. There's 23,000 in there. Um, but they identified those voters based off of only three data points, a first name, a last name, and a year of birth. So I just want people to sit down and think about a county the size of Maricopa County, over 4 million residents, over 2.6 million voters, how many John Smiths we may have that are born in 1970, or how many Maria uh, Garcias we have that were born in 1972. We have numerous uh, instances of each one of those types of names. So that soft data matching technique is going to result in numerous false positive. And that's what we found when we did that analysis. But they also coupled that with using a commercial database. So and any election official knows that the use of these commercial databases leads to inaccurate, uh, especially mailings. And a lot of these commercial databases are used by uh, magazine subscribers to identify individuals that they want to market to. Um, but they're also used by super PACs. So anytime we're approaching an election and voters start getting uh, publicity or, or collateral or pamphlets from political party candidates uh, and we start getting calls about here at the Elections Department and the Recorder's Office about voters' concern that they're receiving election-related mail. They're thinking it's coming from us, but it's not coming from us. It's coming from like a political action committee um, because they're using these third-party data sets. So when you combine soft data matching with the use of a commercial data set, you find lots of false flags or false positives in, in their review. And Janine Petty will go into much more detail related to that finding. Another uh, example of an inaccurate or faulty methodology was their use of the EV32 and EV33 data files. So these are when we send out an early ballot and also when we return an early ballot. And I don't know if you all remember, but back in the middle of the summer, uh, there was a presentation uh, from the Cyber Ninjas where they uh, alluded to there being 74,000 ballots um, sent to voters that didn't request them. Well, ultimately, and even in their report, they retract that statement because it's not true, um, because statute sets out clear uses for these EV32 or EV33 data files. And those are terms that we use to refer to them in statute, but they're basically the sent file and the return file. So in statute, you only produce that sent file or that information up to 11 days before the election. For those, and then you just, you continue to produce the return file all the way up until the day before the election. And these files have a specific purpose, and they task the counties to work with the political parties to come up with a format that works for the political parties so they can get out the vote effort. And if you think about why the political parties would want to do that, they want to know how, who's been sent an early ballot, um, who's returned their early ballot, and if they have members of their parties. They can have, create walking lists and go door to door. They create call files and they can call voters reminding them to return their ballots. So they have very specific purposes. But the Cyber Ninjas kept wanting to compare these two. And in one of the presentations, they made reference that these two files should reconcile perfectly. Well, that would be like trying to, and they have a different purpose. They're a different tool that the, the political parties use. That would like, be like saying, I want this saw to function exactly the same as this hammer, when they have a different purpose. The saw's for cutting, the hammer's for hammering in a nail. Um, they're not used to be 100% reconcilable. Um, and they continue to use 
those files to draw other faulty conclusions about, and that was their second highest number of impacted ballots, 9,000 ballots when they identified that there were two images scanned, um, when really, in, in fact, it was just related to a statutory required task of us curing ballots um, that we have to make an opportunity for a voter. We have a five-day period after the election that if we're questioning the, their signature, they have an opportunity to cure it. Ms. Celia Nabor will go into much more detail about that finding. There are other instances where they lacked an understanding of election laws. There were, one, in one of the findings, they attempted to compare, and I'll provide more detail about this later, but uh, the canvas with the voted file. And they found that there were over 3,000 ballots difference between this official voted file and the official certified Canvas results. However, as any election official would know, that the official voted file does not include protected voters. And so a protected voter is a, a judge, a law enforcement officer, a victim of uh, sexual abuse or harassment. Um, and those are some of the most vulnerable individuals in our society, and federal and state laws have requirements that you do not divulge the address of, the, of those voters. So they are not included in the protected voter file. So that lack of understanding of the voted file, laws related to protected voters, leads them to have a conclusion that there's 3,000 ballots missing, or we have 3,000 extra ballots reported in our canvas than we have actual voters, when in fact, the voted file, the public voted file that they were using, just didn't have the protected voters in it. And then the last area that resulted in them coming to some either inaccurate, misleading, or false conclusions is just a lack of independence and objectivity. If you go through and you think about your day, we make thousands of decisions every single day. And those decisions we're making of how far to take something, especially when you're doing an audit. What type of analysis should we do? Should we reach out to the manufacturer of the vote secure paper and confirm um, whether it allows for bleed through or not? All of these decisions end up um, amassing to an ultimate conclusion within an audit report. And if you are biased or not using an objective process, you're likely to come to a faulty conclusion. So. We mentioned the paper or the, uh, the printer claims. There's one other area that I would like to highlight. Mr. Nate Young will go into much further detail, but this is related to the deleted files. So we've been accused of deleting files on three separate dates, February 2nd, March 3rd, and April 12th. So in the logs that they were provided for February and March, they have all the records that they need to confirm that we didn't delete files. But the one thing that I want to highlight is when we were, were, and so when this was presented to the Arizona Senate, we had members of the Senate cheering that they found us on our live video stream cameras deleting these files. However, what we were doing on those days, on, in the February date, we were preparing for our, uh, our audits from the voting system testing laboratories. But on the March 3rd date, this is just the next, a few days after Judge Tomlinson found that the subpoenas were valid. So we were at the board's direction and the staff at my direction were going and compiling records, ballot images to hand over to the Senate in response to their subpoenas. Uh, on April 12th, what we were doing was packing up the voting equipment to deliver that voting equipment to the Senate um, to respond to their subpoenas. We were not deleting records. We were preparing materials to provide that equipment to the Senate, not deleting files. So the- You're going to go deeper into that here and later? Okay, thank you. Yes, I will. Trying to move the slide ahead. Can you move it to the next slide? Okay, so the, the next 
portion of the presentation I'll be covering is item one, and this comes from page nine of our uh, response report correcting the record. It's gonna talk about, there's a lot of misinformation related to our cooperation with the Senate. We can go to the next slide. So a few things that I, I wanna point out. So on the original subpoenas were issued on January 12th. Why are elected officials that very next day on January 3rd, the morning of January 3rd, were going to meet with the Senate as commanded by the subpoenas, the Elections Department was readying materials. We were going through and identifying all of the, the security logs as, as I commanded to be provided by the subpoenas. We were going through and finding the cast vote records. We were going through and identifying all the election settings that they would need as they performed their review of the of the of the tabulation equipment. All of this information we were ready and on January 15th, we provided them thousands and thousands of records um, to satisfy the subpoenas. We also provided additional information, the cast vote record. This is how every single ballot was tabulated. Uh, it shows how many, how the, how the ballot was, uh, every vote was cast, the percentage of the vote, how much it was filled in, all of this information is contained in the cast vote record. We provided this to the Senate on January 21st, just a few days after the issuance of the subpoenas. The items that we had not provided to the Senate at that point in time were items that either were protected by state law, so those were the original ballots. So state law states that if a after the ballots have been canvassed and certified, they are to be turned over to the county treasurer and maintained in the boxes sealed. And they're only to be unsealed by court order. So at that point in time, we had questions whether we had legal ability to be able to provide and hand over those ballots. Also items that we did not provide at that point in time were the tabulation equipment. This tabulation equipment is identified by the Department of Homeland Security as uh, critical infrastructure. And we did not know that we had the legal ability to be able to hand over that tabulation equipment either. So we asked for judicial clarification. And once we received judicial clarification in late February, that's when we began readying that equipment for delivery to the Senate. Now, the Cyber Ninjas... And Mr. Jarrett, I, I think you summarized that very well. This board is a member of the board at that time. You know, our thinking was that we wanted to get that direction. We had concerns that state law didn't require it. And this board... Uh, you know, not everyone agrees with this decision, but this board made a decision not to appeal that ruling. We got a decision from a superior court judge. We acknowledged that, and we turned over the documents. Obviously, you guys did it. You got it done, but this board directed you to do that. So I appreciate you clarifying that, and I just wanted to make a, a fine point for those who would argue that the Board of Supervisors has been obstructionist throughout. I would argue that the, the record does not support that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Also, shortly after those, those subpoenas were issued in early January, on January 12th, the very next day we sent over a letter asking for clarification on five different items on whether we could provide those. Those included things like ES&S tabulation equipment, which we didn't have. Um, they included things related to some of the, the security locks. We never received a response back from the Senate providing that clarification. The, the items identified in the Cyber Ninjas report, and they include four findings related to this that are misleading, um, are items related to the source, source code passwords. So as part, when we delivered the tabulation equipment to the Senate, we gave them our passwords that we use to access the equipment. That include our user passwords as well as our technician passwords. It also included a security fob that is needed. These are ways that we provide different levels of authentication. Uh, Mr. Nate Young will be going into more details about our authentication processes. 
However, what we did not provide and what we don't have access to and we've never had access to is the source code system passwords. These are maintained by the manufacturer and the voting system te testing laboratories. And I've heard claims out there, well, why doesn't Maricopa County have access to those? And that is a control set up by the manufacturers of the tabulation equipment. What you could do with those passwords is you could change the configure configuration settings. You can make changes to the base setting of the tabulation equipment so then it would no longer be certified. So it's a control mechanism that would prevent end users or elections departments from being able to modify that, that system uh, and some mostly unintentionally making those types of modifications. So we have no need for that that, that password and the security fob that goes along with it or the security token. We had all the passwords and security access that we needed to configure the election for November 2020 and every election in that 2020 cycle. There's a few. Chairman? Also. Yes, yeah, Supervisor Hickman. Because uh, I've bought plenty of, of uh, tractor trailers and every year new technology is different. Uh, of tracking, um, does that also, would those codes also be associated with pro proprietary software systems that all of a sudden, if we got into that, like Coca-Cola's secret or Kentucky Fried Chicken's secret, all of a sudden we could become all that research that they did to offer a product, then Maricopa County could have become a potential vendor or competitor uh, to them? Is it, is it, is it that easy to talk to people and say, I buy, I drink a lot of Coke, I don't know, I don't know how they make it, but is it the same thing? If the, is that the software also, uh, the key to their software? So, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman, given that we don't have access to, with the, that password and that security fob, I don't know exactly what information is on there, but I do understand that there is, uh, you can access some proprietary information okay. um, with that added layer, that additional password. Okay. Other items included in the Cyber Ninjas report about us not providing uh, include uh, our accessible voting devices. Um, these, they say that we are commanded to provide all of our tabulation equipment. The accessible to voting Voting device is not a piece of tabulation equipment. What it is is it's a ballot um, creating a ballot marking device. So this is for any voter that may have a disability. They visit our voting location. They have access to to use this equipment to help them complete the ballot. It prints actually a hard copy ballot that then gets tabulated, but it's not used to actually tabulate a ballot. They also ask for and say in their in their uh, subpoena that we did not provide the poll worker laptops. These laptops are what are connected to our ballot demand printers. So in Maricopa County, we have over 10,000 different ballot styles for the November 2020 general election. They're what we're, we use to make sure that we give the correct ballot style to the correct voter, uh, but they were not included in, in the subpoenas. They also uh, list in there uh, that we did not provide the routers. Uh, Supervisor Hickman, you mentioned the routers. I want to make it clear that our tabulation equipment has never had any routers connected to it. What the routers they're refer referring to are the routers, the county's routers, the, that are used to support the other 50 county departments. Many of those departments have nothing to do with the elections department. As a county, we have to uh, set up websites to communicate with the, uh, with our customers, uh, the residents of Maricopa County. We need to have routers to function as a county, but these routers that they're requesting have nothing to do with the Maricopa County tabulation system because it's on an isolated network. Um, also, uh, these routers, providing these routers would, I expose the county to security risks from our law enforcement agencies, our, our, our courts. Uh, the routers are, can be blueprints to the county's, county's entire network and if used incorrectly could prevent, expose us to major security vulnerabilities. However, in September, the county 
with the Senate negotiated a settlement to hire a special master to review those routers. So we are found in full compliance with the subpoenas. Can I, can I dumb it down, if I may, so I under, fully understand this? Because this was the second week that I took office, and I received one of those subpoenas in addition to the Board of Supervisors and in addition to County Treasurer John Allen. And that was on January 12th, and I remember that we produced a whole bunch of stuff, and you're saying that was produced on January 15th and on January 22nd, correct? Mr. Chairman, uh, Recorder Richard, uh, January 21st. 21st, okay, so the vast, vast, vast majority of the materials that was requested in the subpoenas was done within a two week time frame, correct? That's correct. Okay, and so some of the things that they alleged that they didn't have, such as the accessibility device, the ICX device, or the on-demand printers are for the pretty straightforward reason that they didn't ask for them in their subpoenas, correct? That's correct. Okay, now with respect to the ballots and the tabulation equipment, the board withheld those materials initially because they believed that they could not hand those materials over absent a court order, correct? That's correct. Now, when they got that court order on from Judge Thomason in late February, how many within how many hours did you have those materials loaded on a truck, all of the ballots ready to go over? Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richer, we, we were readying the equipment uh, just the next week. So that came down on a Friday afternoon. On Monday, we had started readying all of that equipment, it, cr creating manifests of the ballots. And I apologize for interrupting, but I just want to make clear for the record, we were never ordered to turn over this. The, the judge, and I know that you know this, but I just want to make clear, said that it was a valid subpoena. So, valid we, subpoena. so we chose to turn over these documents, but we were not ordered to turn the documents over because he said that, you know, that he, he did not rule on that specific point. Yeah, and I just want to highlight the, the, the complete absence of intransigence in that all the board was asking for was for a court direction, and within a matter of hours, those ballots were loaded onto trucks. And yet this rumor persists that the board is somehow not in compliance with the subpoena, which is just dumbfounding to me because we have a document signed by Senate President Karen Fan herself saying exactly that. And if you may, I'm going to read from that. So this is a document executed September 17th, 2021, executed by Karen Fan, the Senate President, and executed by Jack Sellers, then Chairman of the Board, whereas, I quote, the Senate issued subpoenas signed by its President and the Chair of its Judiciary Committee dated January 12th, 2021, and July 26th, 2021, directed to the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, and whereas the county has fully complied with the subpoenas, except it has not provided the subpoena routers and Splunk logs, citing security concerns, the rest of the document goes into how those, those items will be provided, and then at the end of the document it says, the Senate agrees that upon execution of this agreement, President Fan will send on the same day she executes this agreement both an email and a USPS letter to the Arizona Attorney General stating that the county has fully complied with the Senate's outstanding subpoenas. So for anyone who is still under the illusion, the misapprehension that the county was not in full compliance with the subpoenas, then I would say they're in compliance enough to satisfy the president of the Senate. So I don't really see why the conversation can possibly continue. Mr. Jarrett. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. So we'll now move on to, let me see if the remote works. The hand count uh, machine audit. So this was uh, uh, item number, um, I think it was item number two in our report, um, and it included four misleading claims related to uh, the Maricopa County's canvassing. So one thing I want to point out, and I, in my first few slides, um, talked about why we know that we uh, ran a election with integrity, um, why we know that it was accurate, and why we stand by those certified results that we presented to the board on November 20th, 2020, and that there were 2,000, or 2,089,563 actual ballots included in Maricopa County's canvas, and that is the certified results, the results that we stand by. And we know that because we performed the pre and post accuracy tests that were required by statute 
and found that the equipment was accurate. We know that because the political parties performed their hand count of the, the ballots themselves, found, did 47,000 different votes. If there was an issue with the equipment, it would have been identified. It was a statistically significant sample and would have identified that issue. There were no issues found. They found that the tabulation equipment was accurate. We know that because we use federally certified and state certified tabulation equipment as required by law. We know that because we produced canvas reports. Uh, we produced various reports, a detailed canvas that goes precinct by precinct, that's over 10,000 different pages. We produced a summary canvas report. We produced a text file that supports all the detail and data of the canvas report. And we produced a cast vote record. Every single one of those documents reconciles 100% perfectly with the other documents. There's not one variance within any of those documents. And, be, and that's because we use certified accurate tabulation equipment when we prepare those reports. Uh, we also reported our results, our final results, within a few days after the election and then canvassed them within 17 days after the election as required by statute. Very timely. And all procedures that we followed were set out well in advance. Now this stands in contrast to the Cyber Ninjas. So they, um, uh, the Cyber Ninjas, they took over six months. They had continuously changing procedures throughout their entire process, um, through their hand count process. Their reports that they produced, even within their Canvas report, they're off between the Senate contest and the presidential contest that they reviewed by 173 votes. In contrast to us, we tabulated 220 different contests. Um, all of our results match perfectly. The two contests that they reviewed, they're off 173 results. And this isn't related to votes for um, the candidates themselves. It includes all votes for that. So if you're talking about the vote for President Trump, President Biden, Biden the Libertarian candidate Jorgensen, and the write-in candidates, the overvotes and the undervotes, all of those should total and match the exact number that are in the presidential contest as well as the exact number that are in the Senate contest. There should be zero variance. So if you're performing a legitimate hand count process, those would match. Um, so Scott, this is really quite remarkable because on page 15 of your report, you note that the ninjas reported 2,088,569 votes in the presidential contest and 2,088,396 votes in the U.S. Senate contest. Now, the U.S. Senate contest and the presidential contest are on every single ballot, correct? That's correct. And this isn't, this isn't the result of people just not voting in the presidential race or not voting in the U.S. Senate race because that still counts as a vote under this rubric, correct? That's correct, it count as an undervote. So there's no fathomable reason why these votes, these numbers shouldn't match one to one, correct? That's correct. And, and the idea that that doesn't give the counting operation some pause when the two contests we're looking at that are on every single ballot doesn't even match up is truly remarkable to me. Well said, Mr. Richer. <laughs> Mr. Jarrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Also, when we performed the review of the hand count with the Senate's machine count, we saw even further variances. So when we, so in the Senate machines count report that they released, they included these tally sheets that were used by the hand count boards. And then they also included uh, what the Senate machine count found for each box. And then within each box, each batch that was in each box. And so we went through and we identified uh, 180 instances where there was a count for determined by the hand count and a count determined by the Senate machine count. And we th found that in 51 of those 180 that there was a discrepancy. And when we totaled the, the discrepancy, the absolute variance from that, there was a 1,657 ballot difference. And let me s s clarify, this is not for all 10,000 batches that we had provided to the Senate. This is just for the 180 that were included in the Senate's machine count report that was 
and these tally sheets are dated early July, July 7th, 2021. So more than two months after the, the ballots were delivered to the Senate to perform their review. Let me, Mr. Jerry, I think you're touching on something I'd like to give a little clarity to. As you, we, first of all, would you call what, what you have done a forensic audit of the inquiry that the Senate did? Mr. Chairman, no, I did not do a forensic audit of. What, what would you call what you have done? I've done a review of the records that were provided to me. And did you have any, did you feel like you had complete information from the Senate in their inquiry, or did you find a lot of gaps? Uh, can, can you address that, that concept? As far as us, they've made a lot of accusations about what the county did. Is it easy for you, was it easy for you to follow the work that they had done? Mr. Chairman, no, it was not, because we did not have a complete listing of all of um, the records that they they provided. Many of the analysis pieces that we had were, were provided through the draft report, and they were incomplete. They didn't reconcile back even with the numbers they had reported in their official report. Um, there were appendices that were not included in that data. So when we went through what I know we had a, a, a complete record of the findings and we, in our report, we identify which issues and items that we did have an appendix and that we reviewed in our exhibits. We include the, and we clearly mark and identify which is the Cyber Ninjas data that we're using or the Senate contractors data and which is the data that the county was providing as part of its analysis. So I'm confident that we've made accurate determinations as far as our conclusions, but you're correct, Mr. Chairman, we didn't have everything that the, the Senate had or that their contractors had. Yeah, we were told when we were in math class to show our work. I think we've done that, and I don't think the Senate has. Would you agree with that statement? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Jared. Chairman. Yeah, oh, man. Oh, no. Super, yeah, <laughs> Supervisor Galvin. Well, Mr. Jared, taking upon that um, metaphor with math class, if you have to grade this report from an A to an F, what grade would you give it? M Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Galvin, I am not assigning grades today. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll weigh in on that. Um, so I have some information regarding the administration of the hand count. Now, as Scott has already said, the presidential tally was off from the U.S. Senate tally. Their hand count also reported 873 ballots fewer than their machine count. So you might wonder how such sloppiness comes about and because Scott has deferred on giving them a grade, I will tell you the grade that was given to them by two independent assessments of their counting methodology. The first is from Trey Grayson, former Secretary of State of Kentucky, who happens to be a Republican, and Dr. Barry Burden, the Director of Elections Research at University of Wisconsin. They write, the ongoing review of ballots from the November 2020 general election in Maricopa County as ordered by the Arizona Senate and executed by their inexperienced, unqualified contractors, cyber ninjas, does not meet the standards of a proper election recount or audit. They point to three things in particular. One, a faulty ballot count methodology. Two, inconsistent procedures throughout the process. Three, an unacceptable error rate built into the process. As a result, they concluded that, quote, the processes and procedures being used to conduct the Cyber Ninjas review deviate significantly from standard practices for election reviews and audits. Because of these untrustworthy practices and the partisan leanings of those doing the review, any findings by the review are suspect and should not be trusted. If you'll indulge me, the second report I want to read from on this topic is from local elections aficionado Benny White and a Republican who actually lost his race for Pima County recorder in 2020 election but did not contest it, and Larry Moore and Tim Halverson, two former executives from the elections technology and auditing company Clear Ballot, and they have posted this online. I recommend you look at it. Both the hand counts and the machine counts were wrong. 
they said of the cyber ninjas. They were wrong with respect to the total number of ballots cast, the number of ballots in each batch of ballots, the number of ballots cast at each vote center on election day, and which ballots they should have counted. Being close is not the purpose of an audit. In an audit, you try to find discrepancies or lack of discrepancies with an existing record, in this case, the official canvas. Nothing the ninjas did can be related to the official results. Comparison with the official results is necessary of the objective to find out what went wrong during the election. The Cyber Ninja's results don't show anything other than hand counts are unreliable and produce inaccurate results. We knew that in November 2020 and before $9 million was spent on this floor show, end quote. So while they don't give an assigned letter grade, I think it's safe to say we're operating somewhere in the D to F range. I think what is also important and is pointed out by Benny White, Larry Moore, and Tim Halverson is this isn't an audit. An audit, you can make point-to-point -point comparisons such that you can immediately pull out a stack, and if there is a deviation in that stack, you can go and address the vote in record. What they did was simply a recount where they produced a number at the end. Now, the irony of this is that while this was the lion's share of their work over five months, it barely factored into the presentation that they presented to the Senate in September. I would contest that's because it didn't really fit with what those who were paying for the audit wanted. Thank you, Mr. Richard. And I wanted to just take this opportunity to, to let the public know that, you know, again, to this point of the Senate contractors not showing their work, we actually sent a public records request to the Senate to find out what those methods were, uh, you know, what the methods were, were behind this inquiry, and am I correct that they never responded to that public records request? Mr. Chairman, I have not received any information related to that public records request. Thank you. Supervisor Hickman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just real quickly, I found that um, the question from, the, from our esteemed chairman to you about would this qualify as a forensic audit and you said no. Um, l let me ask you about your background, Scott, and a, a little bit of why we hired you so now many years ago. What was your background uh, before we hired you? What, and, 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 and what is it now <laughs> after this? So, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman, I spent over 13 years within the Maricopa County Internal Audit Department. I spent a couple years working for the Maricopa County Community College District as an internal auditor. Um, I have certifications uh, from the Institute of Internal Auditors and, a and the Certified Fraud uh, Examiner's in uh, certifications. Um, and I use that to identify operational efficiencies, uh, look for uh, compliance with uh, federal and state laws as we went through and performed performance-related uh, audits of county departments. I just find it unbelievable that um, that board, some of us were on that board, when this position came up, uh, we selected you and we, I think that was the presence of mind of good management. We know that this key thing through the, MO, uh, the MUA that we had with Adrian Fontes, we needed somebody that had skills in this area and look at what we're doing. And you just gave a definition from a certified auditor that maintaining his certifications has said, this is not a forensic audit. And I certainly remember my discussions with Senate President Fan saying, what is a forensic audit? And she said, you know. Thing is, I still don't know after all this, but I, I know who I can trust in their definition. I can trust this. If you would have handed this sheet to us, not last November, uh, but the November before that, this is how long this has been transpiring. That was the canvas. Would you have handed us this sheet and said my numbers don't match? but you guys need to canvas anyway? Would that have gotten out of your mouth? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman, assuming that's a rhetorical question, because absolutely not. Thank you. And this is their report. This is numbers that they finally provided to somebody 
we just don't even know. We're, we're hectoring about the background of where this number came from. We would not be able to canvass an election with these numbers provided by Cyber Ninjas. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hickman. Mr. Jarrett. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, and the, the one piece, so I've been asked, well, why would we include this portion of the report? It got close. It said that your results were, were accurate. It was close. And first off, this was a complete review of their volume three report, and it was included in that volume three report. But more importantly is for some of the same points that uh, Recorder Richard was making, Supervisor Hickman was making, was this report, there was many faulty procedures throughout. Right. First off, they did not follow Arizona state laws as they went through and performed their hand count. They used a tally method instead of the outstack method, which is required by the laws established by our state legislature. Um, they. Uh, took over six months to complete and report those results. One of the things I mentioned first on is one of the things that builds distrust in election process is the time it takes to report results and how close they are to election day. This took over six months. We had established our procedures well in advance of the election. Their procedures were changing throughout the entire process. You go and you watched on video them performing their hand count process and them using those lazy Susans, and you could not watch a camera view for more than a few minutes when you wouldn't see one of the hand counters looking down, tallying, and that lazy Susan uh, spinning around and one of their hand counters missing the ballot go by. That is not a way to build trust, and this audit is being held up as an example for other states to use for post-election audits. And this is why it's important to highlight these issues that they had as they went through and performed this hand count. And what should be held up as what other states are doing is the laws prescribed by our state legislature, which very clearly delineates the process that we have to follow whenever we are conducting a hand count. And I have great respect for the many people who went down there in the sweltering summer to participate in that hand count, but the cyber ninjas did not see fit to use the same laws, to use the laws enacted by the very Senate that enlisted them to do this hand count, they did not see fit to use those same methodologies and those same laws, which I think are good methodologies and good laws, and were not followed. And Mr. Richer, the reason that those laws were not followed was that this was, an, and I've called it this many times, an extra legal event. This wasn't, that's not even provided for in state law. And that's one of the reasons, this was sort of destined to go in this direction and why we have proper ways to conduct audits that we've done, you've told us that today, and we went beyond it, but we did it in a way that was professionally done using folks that have that experience, not sort of unaccredited folks uh, like we dealt with from the Senate side. So I could not agree more. Uh, so Mr. Jarrett, we're about an hour and a half into this now. So maybe if we can, can move forward here, again, great information, but I wanna be uh, sensitive to everyone's time. Yes, Mr. Chairman, we'll try to speed things along. If we can move one more slide forward. So the next section is from item three of our report and it relates to paper and printer claims. And I already mentioned the first one earlier on as one of the false claims. And all four of these claims uh, that were included in the Cyber Ninjas were determined to be false. Uh, the first one I covered about the bleed throughs um, and that they determined that we weren't using actual vote secure paper because it allowed for bleed through and they had not gone out to the actual manufacturer to current confirm with whether that was a feature or not of the paper. Uh, the other, and so then they then conclude that we also use improper paper. So I want to, 10 different variances or types of paper. And I want to highlight the different ballots that we had provided to the Cyber Ninjas as they perform their review. We have Braille ballots. We have large print ballots. We have Uokava ballots. So those are ballots that are returned from our overseas um, and military voters through a secure portal. 
we print those ballots on standard paper, and then we take those to be duplicated on, and we'll cover in detail further on in this presentation, the duplication process, um, but then duplicated onto a standard ballot using vote secure paper. We also provided them other paperwork that was related to the administration of the election within the voting location. So we print off control slips. We print off affidavit envelopes. All of those types of things would be on different types of paper. But what I can assure you today is that every piece of paper that we purchased for the November 2020 election that we distributed and sent to all of our voting locations that our vendor mailed to voters was 80 pound vote secure paper. We did, and then those are the, the, the paper that then we use to tabulate ballots, not 10 or 10 different variations of paper. Also, they claim, make claims about out of calibration printers. Uh, this is also determined false. We went through, before we send out every printer to a voting location, we go through a detailed checklist. We perform test prints. We make sure that it's calibrated properly. Uh, when we get it and set it up at our voting location, we also then perform more test prints to make sure that it is calibrated correctly and functioning as intended. Every single day that the poll workers operate the, the printers at those voting locations, they're also running test prints. However, I do want to acknowledge during the course of a day, right, a poll worker might need to change toner, or they may need to change and reload paper. At that point in time, they could become slightly out of calibration, but that's why we both go through and perform all of our stress tests, our logic and accuracy tests, and we know that those types of situations don't impact the tabulation of ballots and, and the results, the official results included in the canvas. So can we talk paper a little I'm bit? I'm sorry, more? Supervisor Galvin had a question. I have a quick question. Can you just please go into what would constitute out of calibration? So uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Galvin, this is related to alignment marks on the paper. Um, and one thing I, I want to highlight on page 53 of the Cyber Ninjas report, when they're talking through about bleed through, um, and even in their own conclusions, they identified that the bleed through and the allocate and the, when those alignment marks, so there's a little circle that looks like a bullseye, and sometimes that could be offset. And those could be the result of when a poll worker is then loading that paper, that new paper into the printer, or when they're putting in new toner, it might come offset just a little bit. But they confirmed that, even the Cyber Ninjas confirmed that it didn't impact the results. They couldn't find one instance of it as they went through and Thank did their, their audit. Mr. Richard. So can we can we bury Sharpie Gate three times over now? Because as as you stated in page on page 52 of the Cyber Ninjas report, quote, out of the several thousand ballot images that were manually reviewed, we could not find any images where bleed through was close enough to a ballot oval to cause mistabulation, nor did we see any immediate correlation with adjudication. So even the cyber ninjas, although this was a reversal of their position over the summer, but even the cyber ninjas in their final report state that there was nothing to the Sharpie bleed through incident, correct? That's correct. Now, this was already stated. A lot of people have said, well, we need the Attorney General to weigh in on different things. Well, the Attorney General had weighed in on Sharpie Gate already. In fact, he had reviewed it immediately in the post-election context, and he found that the Sharpies were not an issue, correct? That's correct. And all of this information has been provided by the county on just the facts.vote over the past few months, correct? That's correct. And so, you know, it's sort of dumbfounding and dismaying to me when I hear from people who are purportedly trying to increase election confidence, continue to talk about things like this, continue to go down red herrings, and continue to say in a recorded conversation, quote, now we still don't know what on voting day they gave out, why on voting day they gave out Sharpies to the voters, when we all know that we were told to use a black or blue ballpoint pen, but the media said, oh, there's no Sharpie gate. So that was part of the issue as well. 
So it's just incredibly frustrating to me that somebody would still say that, and that's either evidence that they didn't take the simple step of reading just the fact stop vote, or they didn't read what the cyber ninjas themselves wrote, or they didn't understand what the cyber ninjas wrote, or they didn't put any stock in what the cyber ninjas wrote, or that they simply didn't care. So if you care about improving election confidence, the Sharpie gate is not a thing. Thank you, Mr. Rich, or Mr. Jarrett. Mr. Chairman, so the last claim on uh, this slide relates to questionable ballots and why the cyber dangers didn't provide a lot of detail. These are related to items like yellow dots on our ballots. And this really is a function of us using a variety of different printers at our voting locations and our vendor that mails out ballots for us. So in our voting locations, we have three different printers during the November 2020 general election. We have a Oki B432, we have an Oki, our Lexmark 9, uh, 923, and then we have an Oki 9, 1960. And those are the, the printers that we disseminate to those voting locations. And some of them will spray on microscopic yellow dots that are undetectable to the human eye. Um, and they have no uh, no factor or they don't affect tabulation in any way. And we know that because when we do our logic and accuracy tests, we use those, those printers to print out ballots as we're performing the logic and accuracy tests, and they have no indication on whether a ballot's legitimate or not. Um, it's just part of one of the findings that they included in the report, and it's absolutely false. So with that, I'm going to, uh, that concludes my sections of the initial part of the presentation, I'll circle back to talk about um, items related to protective voters, duplicated ballots, and, um, and, and double scanned ballots. Right now I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Nate Young, and he'll be uh, discussing items related to our tabulation equipment. Mr. Young, thanks for joining us, appreciate it. You got three minutes. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, and Recorder Richer. Uh, I do want to thank Scott for uh, his incredible breadth of knowledge on these topics. He literally went through half of my discussion topics, so I could potentially <laughs> take three minutes. Um, but uh, I do I need to move this? I do. Hey, before you begin, <laughs> <laughs> okay. When did you join the Maricopa County Recorder's Office? Um, I joined the Maricopa County Recorder's Office in March 28th of uh, 2021, so it was actually after uh, the uh, 2020 general election that we're discussing. So after all of these events unfolded, so like me, you would have zero incentive to cover up anything, zero incentive to obfuscate from the truth, zero incentive not to look into these things, correct? Absolutely, I would agree with that. I would say we even have negative incentive because that would be the only crime that we could commit would be potentially interfering with some sort of investigation. But I, I maintain throughout all of this that if you suggest that there was some sort of fraud, then you have to explain people like Nate Young, people like Janine Petty, people like me who joined the office after the November 2020 election and who are there every day and have access to all this materials and say, guys, there's no there there. Thank you, Recorder Richard. Uh, wanted to go into a, a couple of uh, technology-related uh, segments, uh, especially in relation to the Cyber Ninja reports and uh, the presentation made by Cypher to the uh, Arizona Senate on September 24th. Um, a couple of these topics that we'll uh, discuss is uh, the election management system. In this portion of the presentation, I will uh, refer to that as the EMS uh, or the EMS system, EMS server. Uh, cybersecurity best practices practices, internet connections, EMS operating system logs and claims of anonymous logins, uh, dual boot systems and jump boxes, and election data from other states. Uh, Scott has uh, done a great job at talking about the, uh, the items that were not provided to the S Senate, so I will skip over that. Oops. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, the claim that we uh, deleted files uh, from the election uh, management system, the EMS server specifically. And uh, this claim is uh, wildly inaccurate and uh, positions the, um, uh, the 
positions the topic in in a way that uh, is is inaccurate to the the misunderstanding of the cyber ninjas and the uh, cipher to uh, how they understand the way that we do uh, what we do here at the elections office. Um, all data from the elections management system is uh, archived per statutory requirements. Uh, we uh, run regular archives uh, throughout the process of uh, running elections uh, for each tabulation day. And we do keep all of these archives uh, for a period of 24 months uh, per statutory requirement uh, through that. Uh, there's a couple reasons we, we do this. Um, the first is uh, this equipment is used throughout multiple elections. So we do not spend $3 million on elections equipment just to run one election. We have to use that equipment uh, to be proper stewards of a taxpayer money that comes into us to run these elections to uh, use that equipment to process multiple elections. Uh, for example, before the uh, 2020 general election, uh, we actually ran, uh, as Scott mentioned, uh, uh, Mr. Jarrett, uh, uh, four elections prior to that. And since the 2020 general election, we've used uh, the elections equipment to run three other other successful elections in 2021. Uh, so that is one of the reasons why we have to go through a, uh, a full archival process because these systems can't uh, maintain all of this data from all of these different elections in perpetuity. Uh, we don't have the resources on those systems and we don't have the storage space on those on those systems. Um, so that, that's uh, an important thing to remember. Uh, for the uh, 2020 November general election specifically, uh, as I stated, we created a total of 26 individual uh, archive hard drives, one for each tabulation day that happened uh, during that election cycle. And then we took those uh, drives, which ended up being over 11 terabytes of data. Um, computer people will understand what the, uh, the 11 terabytes would mean in a practical stance, but uh, that's a lot of data. So we have to take that data and, uh, and move it off into secure locations. That way we can reference that data back if we have to. For example, uh, if you were to come to Recorder Richer and say, hey, I need to uh, restore or uh, look at that, uh, the data and the elections management system as it was on October 26th uh, of that day of tabulation, we can do that for you. Um, we have that capability and we have that, uh, uh, that data. So let me pause you there. If yeah. I were to say, bring up every elections file from the election management server, from October 2020 or November 2020 during the election, you could do that? Yes. Okay, yes. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, the uh, picture that's listed on the uh, presentation here is actually a, a picture directly from uh, that uh, storage of those 26 daily uh, EMS uh, archive uh, hard drives. They're all sealed in individual packaging and they have those tamper evident uh, seals that are numbered and serialized. Uh, so at any given time, uh, like I said, we can go back to that data and we can reference it. Um, another inaccurate claim is that the EMS system uh, database was illegally purged or nefariously purged, right? Um, the Dominion system has a standard uh, process in place to facilitate that ability for us to uh, run multiple elections off of the same equipment. And uh, that is through a standard archival process, uh, which includes uh, clearing uh, that uh, previous election data to make room for the new elections data. Um, so for instance, uh, in the uh, March 2021 uh, jurisdictional election uh, that uh, happened for Goodyear, um, we ended up having to uh, use the same, uh, well, we were starting to use the same uh, equipment uh, that was used in the 2020 general election. We uh, need to uh, archive the old election, the 2020 general, and create new election uh, uh, processes and, and, and files. Um, and in doing so, um, we use their standard archival process, uh, which included uh, uh, moving and uh, clearing out the uh, November 2020 uh, information. Um, so this is not a nefarious process. This is what we do uh, to, like I said, be good stewards of taxpayer money. Uh, so if uh, any, any claims that uh, these processes are not above board are just wholly inaccurate. 
Um, the other uh, aspect that uh, I think we touched on quite a bit was uh, logic and accuracy testing. So during the February 2021 um, uh, audits that uh, Recorder uh, Richer and uh, uh, Mr. Scott Jarrett mentioned uh, in their back and forth, we had two different companies, uh, Pro v and and SLI Compliance, uh, come in and perform their functions. They performed a logic and accuracy test. In order to do that, we had to clear the results uh, uh, from that same uh, 2020 general election uh, project within the Dominion Democracy Suite uh, project file. Uh, so that would be um, one of a uh, multitude of reasons why um, we would legitimately try and clear out data to uh, process uh, further elections. Mr. Chairman? To Advisor Hickman. Oh, man. I'm, get, I'm getting PTSD right here when you're bringing up this time frame. I'm even getting PTSD. <laughs> You talk about the Goodyear election and how we were preparing and uh, the county reaching out. We, we signed contracts with the municipalities um, to run their elections. Uh, Phoenix is large and capable of doing it themselves. I remember how important I felt that that city was in, is in my district as well as Supervisor Gallardo's. Felt it was extremely important and we had this, this swirl uh, around us. And looking at the report and seeing these archival systems that were going on, plus we, I, I can't say how important this was to me, two independent companies. It wasn't that they were just independent coming to work together. That's what you got with Cyber Ninjas and three different, four different, eight different companies. It was one company flying in, staying separate from the county as well as the other company performing what they, we tasked them to do, paying for it, Maricopa County taxpayer paid for that, them buttoning up everything, leaving, and then the other company coming in. So when I keep hearing these two companies and independent, I think people think that maybe they huddled up, but they didn't. And we did that on purpose because we wanted to find out what if one company finds something and the other company doesn't? we're gonna be able to be able to see what happened in their, their processes and procedures that something came up with one and another, and then another company would say, well, we didn't do that because it didn't match with this statute or it didn't match, uh, it never came up. They, they both performed their jobs, we paid them for their jobs, and they found that the, the system operated exactly as what we leased. So um, again, you mentioned how important this board takes it to run municipal elections for these municipalities. And I'm just gonna say a little bit of hearsay because I wasn't in the meeting. We talked, somebody talked about that to a legislator and some legislator said, we don't care, that's your problem. I'm gonna leave that as hearsay because I wasn't in there, but that shocked me uh, still to this day. Um, and someday I get to ask that legislator, did you actually say that? That's in my district. So, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Hickman. Mr. Young. Uh, thank you for your remarks, uh, uh, Supervisor Hickman. Um, to continue, they, uh, in the Cypher presentation and the Cyber Ninjas report, uh, they made numerous claims that uh, during their analysis of the EMS server and the tabulation equipment, uh, there were uh, multiple instances of uh, either corrupt ballot data. Oh, I, I apologize, I'm not messing with the clicker here. Um, they made multiple accusations of corrupt, corrupt ballot images and missing ballot images when uh, Cypher put uh, the uh, forensic clones that I'm, I presume he made uh, together uh, to an analyze the server. Um, the, uh, the issue with that is uh, we're not exactly sure how uh, Cypher recompiled all that data. Um, there was uh, a history where uh, Cypher uh, unfortunately uh, made a, uh, an error in compiling a, a RAID array. Uh, I don't wanna go into too many details there, but uh, it could also be the answer for why he potentially found uh, corrupt and ballot Im uh, missing ballot images on the EMS system. Um, I'm here to say that doesn't necessarily matter um, 
primarily because we gave the Arizona Senate a hard drive on April 22nd that has a copy of all of the ballot images that were produced, uh, uh, almost 2.1 million ballot images. And those uh, ballot images uh, were provided to uh, directly to the Arizona Senate. We had a copy of, those, uh, uh, of that hard drive, and we took the screenshots from the report and from the presentation, and we looked at each individual um, uh, claimed uh, corrupt, uh, corrupted image, uh, our ballot image and missing ballot image, and we were able to find those uh, missing ballot images and corrupt ballot images uh, on that drive that we have in our possession. So um, the, the Arizona Senate absolutely had the, the proper data that they needed uh, to go through and, uh, and maintain their, their audits here. Mr. Chairman, just want to provide one clarification. In April, we provided them actually nearly uh, four, or just over four million images because the Senate subpoena asked for pre-adjudication and post-adjudication images. So as an image of the ballot, as it was going through the tabulation before it had been adjudicated, and even if a ballot doesn't go through adjudication, there's still a pre-adjudication image and a post-adjudication image. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so in, in summary, uh, these uh, accusations are uh, considered inaccurate claims, uh, but with the additional uh, documentation and the ballot images that we provided to them, it, uh, it ultimately uh, should not have affected their report whatsoever. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one of the major topics of conversation, uh, especially with Supervisor uh, uh, Hickman's uh, previous uh, previous words, was um, the accusation uh, that uh, the EMS system as a whole had connections to the internet. I'm here to say that is 100% false. There is no connections. Uh, to the outside world uh, within this EMS system. Um, Supervisor Hickman asked uh, what the definition of an air gap network is. Um, there's a diagram up on the screen to, to review, but in, in layman's terms, if you take a metal box, you put an election system in this metal box, put a top on it, and there are no other uh, uh, cables, no, no nothing. It's just in, in its own little isolated thing. That's what this election system is. Um, Given that, how do you get into it, you know, uh, from the outside world? You can't. So that's exactly what this system is. Um, Mr. Jarrett mentioned that there are no routers in this EMS system. That is absolutely true. There are what we call unmanaged switches in this, uh, this air gap system, and those unmanaged switches are essentially dumb. All they do is take traffic from one, uh, maybe the tabulation machines, and route it to the server. That's all it does. Uh, you can't really customize that stuff at all. Um, so the, the other aspect of, uh, of this is um, And the one thing that's important to point out is that we have made this information public and we produce this information many times. Uh, we, we even put a variation of this, uh, of this diagram up on Twitter, but that doesn't seem to matter uh, based on these claims. Most of these claims are solely uh, based on the, the idea that the EMS system is not air-gapped and the EMS system has been compromised. And I'm here to say it hasn't been. Um, one thing uh, that is important to point out um, that, don't just take my word for it, we had three, and we, we mentioned two of them already, but we actually had a third, we had three independent uh, forensic uh, and, and auditing companies come through and independently verify this air gap network. And uh, the, the first two um, in uh, the February 2021 timeframe was Pro-V Pro -V and V and SLI compliance. And the most recent one uh, was a, uh, another company called Packet Watch. Uh, they are a well-respected cybersecurity and forensics firm uh, staffed by uh, former uh, government uh, cybersecurity and information technology uh, personnel. And uh, they spent a, a full uh, afternoon going through our systems. Uh, they were looking for wireless networks that, that could have been originating from our system. They didn't find anything. Uh, they uh, looked at the, uh, the track that's in the ceiling, uh, as uh, Supervisor Hickman, Hickman mentioned. Uh, they followed every th all the cabling back. Uh, they did not find any um, uh, nefarious piece of equipment, uh, and they, they looked at pretty much everything that's in that, in, in that room. So can we, 
let's can we describe for those who haven't been to run or excuse me to MCTEC before okay. uh, the elections management server. So this is the one server on which live election results are kept. Correct. Correct. And that server is in a glass box that can be viewed from all vantage points. Correct. Correct. And that glass box can only be accessed by a handful or fewer of people, myself not included, correct? Correct, I don't even have access to that room. And you can see wires coming out of that room, right? Correct, uh, actually the general public can go on to our live streaming cameras, uh, recorder.maricopa.vote, or sorry, recorder.maricopa.gov forward slash elections, go on to our live streaming page and any of the uh, cameras in the ballot tabulation center, you can see the little tracks in the ceiling. And the wires run directly to the tabulation correct. systems, correct? Correct. So there's nothing else other than those wires which are visible to the human eye and which are under cameras 24-7 that enters into this classroom, correct? Correct. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, that would sound like there's, there's, no sec there's no need for secret video. I mean, if it's 24-7, it's statutorily required by this state uh, in the tabulation center, I believe, isn't it? And do we keep, and do we keep those records of, of everybody that walks in? Mr. Chairman and Supervisor Hickman, that's correct. We keep all of our, so it's also restricted through badge access records. All of those are maintained as well as the videos over the ballot tabulation. I know, and I know we're gonna get to this, but I heard an applause line at the Cyber Ninjas hearing um, about having video capture of people. I think we're gonna get to that, but that's 24-7 video av available to every voter in Maricopa County and actually the United States. You just access it and you can watch it. Is that, is that, is that a secret video? I don't, I don't think so. So Mr. another Chair rhetorical question, uh, just living through this madness. Okay. Uh, so um, there are uh, also other ways that we can identify and confirm that uh, this system is indeed air-gapped and not connected to the internet. Uh, a couple of those is to look at the logs. Uh, similar to, uh, as Mr. Jarrett mentioned, SLI Compliance and uh, the company that uh, we recently contracted with Pat Packet Watch, we all looked through the, the different logs. There are various places on the server that you can uh, review and check to see if there is a connection. Um, uh, a couple of other interesting uh, points to note. Um, there is an antivirus system on that, uh, an antivirus service on that system called uh, VAST. It is set up to auto update itself. Um, it's in the configuration. Um, same thing with uh, Java. Everybody I think is familiar with Java. It's, it's everywhere. Um, that is configured to update itself as well, but even, and I'll, I'll mention it uh, further down in this uh, discussion, but even uh, Cypher and the Cyber Ninjas admit that those uh, have not been updated since uh, August 2019, uh, and that just happened to be the month that we installed all of this equipment, right? Um, so that is uh, evidence if, if these systems really did uh, have the ability to hit the internet, uh, those, uh, those two items would have been updated. Uh, same thing with, uh, with the Microsoft operating system. Uh, if you have a Windows computer uh, at home, you would probably be familiar with uh, how crazy it, it, it hits you with uh, those update notifications. That's the same thing that the server does. Uh, so if the server had the ability uh, to go out and talk to the Microsoft server and say, hey, I need updates, it would absolutely say, yeah, I've got updates for you. Here, show that to the the technician that's that's looking at you. And it, it can't do that. There's also a log that goes through and, and shows every single time a, um, a uh, the server went out to Microsoft to look at, look for an update, and each one of those logs says failed, 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 failed. Um, there are a couple of other logs uh, that we looked at uh, to confirm this. Uh, one of them is uh, the domain name service uh, requests. It's often referred to as DNS. Uh, those showed failed, uh, failed results. Uh, we also looked at a, another log called Network Connectivity Status Indicator, uh, the NCSI logs. It's not the TV show, it's, it's the logs. Um, and those logs also showed a complete lack of connectivity and, and lack of, of positive response back from the internet, which would absolutely be there. If you go to a, another uh, computer or a server, looked at the same logs, you would see a call and a response. And it's important to note, uh, especially throughout the rest of this uh, presentation, that in, 
nowhere in the Cyber Ninjas and the Cypher reports did they confirm that there was a response back from any of these, of these items that they pointed out. Um, and as I said, uh, PACA Watch and SLI compliance has confirmed this, uh, that none of these uh, connections were, were able to successfully receive a response or even go out. No, it was, it was really what I found to be quite remarkable was that we were simultaneously criticized for not having the most up-to-date software that would be automatically downloaded to these software programs if connected to the internet, while simultaneously being accused of having machines that were connected to the internet. So those are incompatible and, and it just didn't happen. That's why we didn't download the software upgrades. Correct, um, and we'll go over a couple of reason, other other aspects of that too. Um, I, I also found uh, that accusation to, if I can steal one of your words, recorder Richer, unfathomable. So, um, oops, thank you, Mr. Jarrett. <laughs> There we go. Um, so this is actually an excerpt from the uh, Cypher presentation that was on September 24th. Uh, this excerpt, uh, according to Cypher, shows that there are some uh, applications or services on the EMS system that we're trying to reach out and connect to the internet. Um, interestingly enough, uh, during the presentation, uh, Cypher couched that, uh, this, this evidence, as uh, a, um, as evidence itself that the machine did connect to the internet, which, which was not the case at all. Um, so uh, something to, uh, that's important to understand is all of these uh, examples from this screenshot are all certified uh, EAC applications uh, from uh, within the uh, Dominion application uh, suite. So uh, we have uh, examples of uh, VAST, which is the antivirus system. We have examples from Microsoft in this screenshot. We have examples from Java also in the screenshot. Um, all of these uh, services we're trying to call home. Um, that is a uh, term that we, we typically use in the IT field um, where a, an application is trying to reach out to its manufacturer servers to look for updates or to uh, maybe send statistics or something like that. And uh, as we stated in the previous, uh, previous section, uh, none of these were successful. Um, you know, it's, it's great they pointed it out and said, hey, you know, these, these were attempting, but uh, this is not evidence of, of mal malfeasance. It has uh, uh, no evidence of, of successful connections. So uh, I do find it kind of weird how they included this in their report, even though uh, there was nothing that, that came of it. Um, in a similar vein, um, Thank you. <laughs> in a similar vein, um, they uh, mentioned that there, were, there was evidence of the EMS workstations. So we were talking about the EMS server, now we're talking about the EMS workstations. Um, evidence that those also had internet connections. Um, but these are even easier to debunk, uh, primarily because of, uh, of what they were. Um, earlier in this uh, presentation, uh, Mr. Jarrett mentioned uh, SLI compliance finding a uh, uh, a situation where somebody typed in brightness into the computer and Bing uh, went and did a search. Same thing happened here. Um, one of the uh, examples that Cyber Ninjas provided was a, uh, a Bing search, as you can see on the, on the screen, the URL here, uh, bing.com. There is a, a search parameter that's in there as well, um, and it's an IP address, 192.138.100.11. Uh, Cypher mentioned that this was uh, strange and peculiar, but he also mentioned that this would be considered an internal IP address. Um, so in the EMS system, um, there is a, uh, an, an IP address range. So it's a, it's a range that the uh, EMS equipment are able to pull an IP address from, and that way all of the equipment has their own, their own address, their own identifier. Right, um, that's that's exactly what we're seeing here. Well, the interesting part about this is uh, similar to that brightness situation. Uh, this was a typo. Um, the technician uh, that did this at the time was uh, trying to get to 192.168, so not 138.100.11. 
Uh, due to that typo, Bing, which is uh, a built-in function of Windows 10, uh, took over and said, hey, I can't find this on, on your internal network, so I'm not gonna go there. I'm gonna try and search for it now. So that's exactly why it came up here. They had two other examples, and uh, those are actually the default home pages uh, for Windows 10. So if you open up uh, Internet Explorer or uh, Microsoft Edge, which are all default browsers, uh, it'll come up uh, and at least try and attempt to hit those, uh, those specific addresses. So, so, Mr. G oh, I, I apologize, Finner. I think you have well established that our machines were not connected to the internet. Just want to kind of move, because I knew we do have two more That's presentations fine. here. Thank you. Okay. Um, just to quickly touch on this, because it was a, a salient point in this, uh, this Cypher presentation, uh, they claimed that this IP address, uh, 192.168.100.11, uh, looked weird. Why would the uh, computer be connecting to that? Um, that's a printer. It's an HP printer uh, that was not provided to the Cyber Ninjas uh, pursuant to the, uh, the subpoena, primarily because they didn't ask for it. Um, so the way that you configure this printer is because uh, by going through a web configuration portal that is uh, hosted by the printer itself, and you can go through and change all kinds of different uh, settings. One of those settings, and this is uh, one of the uh, things that also got an applause line during that, uh, that Cypher presentation, was uh, he mentioned uh, a wireless uh, network, it's actually an IP address at the bottom there, uh, 192.168 uh, network underscore wireless LAN. He used this as a means to say that we lied and we said that there were no wireless uh, networks and wireless devices in that building. Um, that is that is a completely inaccurate claim. Um, that is a uh, that is because the printer itself has a built-in wireless card that we are not able to remove. A lot of uh, these uh, computer elements, we can go in, grab the uh, the card straight out, so then it's completely gone. Sometimes they are built so nested into the computer that we can't take it out, or or in this case, the the printer. So what you can do is go into the configuration and turn it off. And that's what we did. Um, in the, uh, in the uh, re reporting to the, the bottom left of here, this is actually the printer uh, uh, saying that the device itself is inactive. And that meets all EAC requirements uh, for a secured system. And uh, we, we discussed this a little bit, so I won't go too far into it, but uh, this is about REWeb uh, 1601, REGIS uh, uh, 1202. REWeb, as um, Mr. Jarrett mentioned, uh, hosts our uh, recorder.maricopa.gov website. So absolutely, it's gonna be on the internet, for sure. Um, REGIS is uh, the host for our maps. So if you go onto our website and try and search anything map related, it's going to be served up from this REGIS 1202 server. Um, the interesting and disappointing aspect was uh, Cypher during his presentation uh, nested these two uh, servers that are absolutely not on the, uh, the EMS network with the rest of the EMS systems and uh, made it look like they were all part of one system and that these two computer or two servers that are on the internet for sure were on the EMS system when that is uh, patently false, that is absolutely false. So the two smoking guns of internet connectivity were what I used to go onto the internet every single day through the recorder's office and have no relationship to the election management server. Correct. Anybody can go on to recorder.maricopa.gov right now and their response, the web, web page that comes up will be served to them from REWeb 1601. Full stop. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Um, the uh, next interesting uh, claim is that the, uh, the county doesn't follow cybersecurity uh, best practices and standards from a group called CISA, uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Association. Try and say that 10 times fast. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the county itself uh, only does business with uh, vendors that follow these specific uh, regulations and guidelines from the EAC uh, when it comes to uh, tabulation equipment. Uh, the EAC is, is a uh, well-known body when it comes to uh, the guidelines. They make all of their guidelines uh, public and accessible, so you can go onto their website, look for, look for all these standards and, and operating procedures, et cetera. Um, Cypher and Cyber Ninjas 
had the ability to do this, but for a lot of these claims, it didn't look like they did. Um, so that, that makes the, the rest of these claims a little bit interesting uh, that they would claim it given that they had those resources. Um, the server operating system and the antiviruses or antivirus system was not updated uh, because it is against the rules for EAC. Uh, if we were to go through and manually do those updates, even if they were offline updates, you can grab the updates from the internet and bring them in, um, that would violate our EAC certification and actually put us in to a position where the Secretary of State uh, may decertify our actual equipment that we have and cost us another three and a half million dollars or whatever it was. So to reiterate that, because this shows a shocking disregard for election law and election procedures, but if we had done what Cypher had suggested, we would have fallen out of compliance with the EAC, correct? 100%. Yeah, uh, anytime that we uh, want to do an update or whatever, we have to go to Dominion and then they have to get a uh, uh, essentially authority from the EAC to perform those updates. Everything's well documented. Uh, everything is, is uh, clearly above board. If we were to do that on our own, as uh, Recorder Richard mentioned, uh, we would be completely out of compliance. Okay. Um, there, I've got a couple more things here. <laughs> um, uh, they also claim that we didn't have an external log management system. That's not a part of the EAC certification. And that would add a, an additional complication that we just uh, uh, would not want to take on in this uh, specific uh, closed network. Um, the uh, Cypher also cited uh, that the... Um, that we're not following uh, a number of these guidelines that uh, CISA points out that we should be following, um, but it's uh, important to point out that we're not uh, the normal enterprise network that these guidelines are built for. Uh, we are a closed, uh, air-gapped network that is specific to tabulating votes. Uh, so it's it's not Recorder Richer going onto uh, his laptop and checking his email. It is specific to uh, what that system does. So these EAC uh, or CISA guidelines would not necessarily uh, apply. Okay. Um, another thing that they mentioned uh, that we are not running any of the uh, the patches uh, that they would consider to be up to date. Uh, we went through that a number of times and that is absolutely true. Um, that is uh, primarily because we would be out of EAC compliance. Um, the last time uh, that uh, the system was primarily patched was in August 2019. Um, and then subsequently, the entire system was certified on September 11th, 2019. Um, the topic of credential management has been a big one. Um, they said that, uh, our Cypher said that we uh, use shared passwords uh, across uh, multiple systems, which makes us inherently insecure. Um, that is not true. Uh, we actually have multiple ways of authenticating uh, based off of individual systems uh, that are within this EMS uh, platform. Um, and we also have a number of security uh, controls of a physical nature. Uh, we have restricted badge access, uh, as Recorder Richard mentioned, he doesn't have access to uh, certain places in that building. Um, I don't have access to the actual ballot tabulation room every, where everything happens. I swipe my badge and nothing happens. Um, we also, uh, as uh, Scott, uh, Mr. Jarrett mentioned, um, we have uh, detailed logins and sign-in sheets that we reference. So if we see somebody on surveillance or something like that, and there's no uh, reference to that uh, person being signed in, then we try and investigate and figure out why that was that would be the case. Um, as it's been mentioned a few times, we have surveillance cameras everywhere. You can't go through that uh, ballot tabulation center uh, without going through uh, two uh, badge access doors and without being on uh, probably 20 individual cameras as you walk through that, that building. And we have two separate camera systems. So one is a, uh, a private sur uh, surveillance system that is monitored by the, uh, uh, the county security services group, and one is that live streaming camera system that we've mentioned a number of times before. And uh, the other thing too is we have observers that uh, go around, uh, these bipartisan observers uh, that are there at all times during tabulation. So uh, we, we not only have uh, technology helping us out uh, to make sure that these systems are secured um, through multiple passwords. I won't describe the, uh, um, the 
image on the screen right now, uh, but we also have uh, physical eyes in the, in the building and they can uh, tell us if anything uh, nefarious is happening. Um, and then, uh, as uh, we mentioned uh, many times before, we have logic and accuracy tests that can uh, tell us uh, if uh, any of our systems have been compromised. Okay. And then um, this is a topic that uh, Mr. Jarrett uh, touched on a little bit uh, as, as far as the operating system logs and the accusation that we deleted the logs. Um, I wanted to clarify one specific point. Uh, the accusation is not that we deleted the logs necessarily. It's bec the accusation is that we flooded the logs uh, to cause a deletion. So there, there is a, there's a difference between the two. Um, so the, the server that we use is running off of a Microsoft Server 2012 R2 operating system. Um, I, I mentioned that because by default, that uh, operating system log has a 20 megabyte capacity. Uh, so when the logs start filling the capacity up, it hits this 20 megabyte threshold, and then it starts using this thing called uh, first in, first out. Sometimes it's referred to as FIFO. So uh, that means that as more, op uh, more events start coming into that log, older events start falling off. And, and that's a standard process. Every, every server uh, has that configuration right out of the box. Um, it's, it's up to uh, the individual uh, uh, server manager to actually change that. Um, we are not able to change that, uh, that setting. That is a default setting that was part of the EAC certified build of that operating system. Um, we have put in a request uh, to Dominion to uh, request of the EAC for a de minimis change uh, to increase the size of that operating system log so uh, we don't have as as, uh, as often a fall off uh, or a, a, a FIFO situation um, with those logs. Um, but um, what I wanted to point out specifically here was that this server doesn't act like every other server. Uh, Cypher claims that uh, the servers that he looked at uh, that had the same operating system didn't show the same, uh, the same oper or operating logs. Well, that's because we use additional, uh, we call them hardening scripts uh, from Dominion. Uh, they're, they're installed at the time of the, the machine install. And it's a series of scripts, uh, configurations, uh, profiles, and uh, you know, other, other configs within the SQL database uh, et cetera, that in increase our security uh, posture within that specific machine, uh, but it also increases the amount of logs and the log detail that we get uh, from that. So uh, there was this claim that he wasn't able to, to do this, uh, this comparison, but it's not apples to apples. He's comparing apples to oranges here. Um, and uh, Scott mentioned a, a number of dates, so I won't necessarily go through those in too much depth, but uh, we have claims of uh, uh, these logs being flooded on February 11th, uh, logs being flooded on March 3rd, and also logs being flooded on March, uh, or sorry, April 12th. So uh, this is actually, can we go one more? We're just having clicker problems today, aren't we? There we go. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is an example of the, the actual quantified claims uh, that the Cyber Ninjas made uh, and, and Cypher himself. Um, so for the uh, February 11th date, uh, there was a claim that uh, 462 logs were flooded in by a uh, automated uh, script that was run by one of our, uh, one of our personnel. Um, we take issue with that because we did not find during our analysis that there were 462 uh, events actually produced during that time frame. Uh, we actually only found 412. We, that's weird because our logs are or should be the same as, as the ones that Cypher is, is reviewing. Um, the even more strange one is uh, this claim that got a lot of press that uh, on March 3rd, uh, 37,683 logs were flooded into the security log. That is patently, in my opinion, physically impossible because uh, 37,686 logs are a lot of logs. Um, that security log itself, because of that 20 megabyte threshold, only is able to contain 35,000 to 38,000 logs total. So that would have filled the entire log from, from start to finish in just that one uh, short time period and, sh and short session. Um, and, you know, we tried to come up with that 37,000 number and we just couldn't. Uh, we went through all kinds of things. We actually asked Packet Watch to uh, try and come up with that number too and they couldn't either. Uh, so, so 
that one's uh, definitely interesting, and I still am curious about how you came to that number. Uh, and then uh, February 12th, as uh, Scott mentioned, that was the date that we were uh, packaging the machine up for delivery to the Arizona Senate. Um, Cypher claims that we flooded the logs with 330 uh, uh, individual events, but that was us getting the machine ready for uh, transportation or to transport it over to the Arizona Senate. You can't just shut a server off. You can't hold down the button and then just let it turn off after five seconds. You have to go through a process of shutting down SQL services, of shutting down uh, a number of other dependent systems, and then eventually uh, that system would be cleared to shut down. Um, so uh, another thing to mention uh, quickly is uh, we provided manual exports of server logs in a couple of other instances. Uh, Scott mentioned uh, a, a couple of them earlier. Uh, January 15th, we provided a couple of sets of logs uh, to the, uh, the Arizona Senate and also uh, April 21st of uh, 2021. And uh, the other interesting part about this is uh, Cypher claims that he wasn't able to find any logs beyond February 5th, uh, 2021, which is interesting because our logs uh, that we have go well, be, well past that into November of 2020. So it begs the question what logs are actually being looked at during this analysis. Okay. Um, this one was, was an interesting claim um, given that um, it's, it was pretty easy to debunk, to be honest. Um, there is, uh, within the security logs themselves, there's a category of logs called the 4624 logs. And that essentially logs all of the instances of logons onto the computer. Um, and within that uh, 4624 category of logs, there's different login types. So the claim from Cypher is that um, there is a series of what he uh, considers atypical logins, so suspicious logins, I guess, would be a, a, a good way to say it, um, of these uh, 4624 type three. Type three is a, a considered a remote login, so essentially somebody that's not in the room in front of the server itself using the keyboard is remoting in from another computer. Um, this is something that we do every single day. Um, the EMS Client 01 is our primary workstation. We use uh, that workstation to remote into the server because it's convenient, right? Um, we, uh, we need to remote into the server every now and again to make sure that configurations uh, are properly set, that uh, the server is running uh, at its optimal conditions. Um, so you're gonna see logs from that type three. What he says is weird is that in a specific log that he screenshotted uh, and mentioned, uh, there is a networks uh, field section that uh, would typically show the computer name and the IP address of that specific computer. Um, that was missing from the screenshot and he said, this is weird. You know, this would be considered an atypical login. Um, the screenshot that he provided was a snippet of that log. If you look at the screenshot, there's actually a scroll bar, you know, on like Word, if there's a lot more underneath it, you can scroll down. Um, if you scroll down, there's a whole series of descriptors uh, that Microsoft themselves put into the log and one of those descriptors describes exactly what uh, he was seeing that he felt was suspicious or atypical. And I wanted to uh, uh, actually read off verbatim what this uh, descriptor was uh, in, inside that specific event. Um, and this is Microsoft, mind you. It says, quote, workstation name is not always uh, available and may be left blank in some cases, end quote. So to me, that is a... Uh, and an example of uh, lack of detail, all he had to do was scroll down and see what he thought was nefarious was actually written by Microsoft saying, hey, you might see this, it's not anything to be concerned with. Um, so that, that's a very uh, interesting claim that uh, we were able to uh, account for. Um, the other thing that Cypher said specifically about these is that uh, he did not see a companion uh, credential validation event in the logs. And uh, we, during our analysis, found that that is not true. Uh, every single time that we saw a log like this, within a couple of seconds to a couple of minutes, we found a, uh, a log type called uh, 4776, which is a credential validation event. And it, it, without fail, we were not able to find one that didn't have a corresponding credential validation. So that, that takes two of those claims and, and it completely negates them as uh, is inaccurate and misleading at best. And uh, the, 
This claim was, was interesting because uh, Cypher uh, presented uh, a few pictures of a system with two hard drives in it. Uh, he claimed that these two hard drives uh, in this system could uh, represent a security risk to the, the systems, um, which uh, his, uh, his methodologies and his, and his examples of why uh, don't really comport. But let me, let me back up real quick. Um, SLI compliance during their February 2021 uh, review actually looked at this machine. It was an adjudication machine. I, I forget the actual number, but uh, they pulled that machine out and opened it up and also find, uh, they found this second hard drive uh, in this machine. Um, they also thought it was peculiar, uh, but they noticed that it wasn't plugged into the motherboard. So the way that a hard drive works is you have to have power to it and you also have to have a data connection to it uh, and that data connection goes to the motherboard. That data connection was missing. Um, it was not plugged in. Um, so essentially that meant that yeah, there was a second hard drive installed, but it wasn't connected and it wasn't functional at all, full stop. Um, the uh, SLI compliance did their diligence on it. Uh, they took a forensic clone of it and they determined that the last time that drive was actually uh, accessed and, uh, and that data was, was viewed or, or manipulated was July 31st of 2019. This was months before the server itself was even certified and uh, they didn't include it in their uh, report from their February audit because they didn't feel like it uh, rose to the, uh, the level where it needed to necessarily be reported, but they kept uh, the record of it in their, their own logs. Um, to reiterate, this uh, the second hard drive in the machine had no bearing on the security or the effectiveness of the EMS system or the tabulation processes within the EMS system. Um, the machine was completely, uh, or the, the hard drive itself was completely unplugged. Um, Cypher claimed that it was a dual boot system and a dual boot system is essentially a machine with these two hard drives. Both of them would have to be plugged in and you'd have to be able to enter, enter an operating system from one or the other. Since this one was not plugged in, you couldn't do that. It would not be considered a dual boot system at that point. Um, he also claimed that it could be considered a jump box. And uh, that's a techie term of uh, a machine that is used to then gain access to another machine. And that is a physical impossibility in this particular uh, situation because that second hard drive was, was not plugged in. So uh, the idea that they would make these claims, uh, say that it's, it's a dual boot system and that it could be used as a jump box system is is unfathomable as well uh, in that particular moment. Um, Supervisor Hickman. Maybe I, uh, maybe I didn't catch this. So why is there the existence of a second um, hard drive? Why, why was it, why was it there? And, and does that, is that like a stop? To, like if the one melts down during election, we're ready to go with another? Okay. So, or, okay. Uh, thank you for the question, Supervisor Hickman. Um, to the best of our, our knowledge, uh, this uh, particular machine was used uh, for demonstration purposes of functionality from uh, the Dominion system. And uh, it was a mistake uh, where they repurposed the machine to be in our EMS environment. And uh, it was uh, that mistake where they put a regular hard drive in, did not take out the original one that was in it, and both hard drives ended up being in the system. Uh, so it, it would not be considered a redundant uh, hard drive uh, okay. for that system. I just didn't point. know if it was redundant. I yeah. Believe me, again, run a big business where mistakes are made every day. Um, and you just live with them. I'm gonna t maybe touch on that a l little bit later. But I was just wondering if that's there in case we have an issue, and if so, if it's there, does that also stay certified? So it, all it is is just a inert piece of equipment yeah. that, okay. Uh, Supervisor Rickman, that's a great way to say it. It's an inert piece of equipment that uh, did not uh, affect the uh, EMS system at all. That's why SLI compliance, when they found it, uh, they didn't uh, raise it as, a, as an issue in their, in their audit report. Um, uh, one point of uh, what we would consider continuous improvement is that uh, from uh, this, from that point forward, uh, we are going to change the policy. Uh, typically, we would not open up the computers during our user acceptance testing, but uh, now we're going to. 
So we will open up the machines, make sure that there is not a second hard drive installed. All of the uh, componentry that should be in that machine is effectively there. So that concludes my uh, portion of this uh, presentation. I'll hand it back to Mr. Nate, Kerr. before you go, <laughs> if I may, please forgive my quietness sure. for, for not for a lack of interest, but a lack of knowledge about some of these topics. But sure. I really would refer anyone to the actual report Absolutely. if you want to go in depth on some of these technical issues, which Nate speaks at about with greater specificity there. But I was struck by three things um, that you mentioned in our response to the report is one, the number of internal contradictions present in Cypher's report. Two, the number of things that they could have easily researched to figure out why the county did what it did. And three, that Cypher criticized the county for not doing things that are prohibited by law or by EAC certification standards. And I think that really sort of captures almost 95% of the arguments that Cypher makes. Would you agree? I would absolutely agree with that. And before you go, I really, just because it's been said so many times, I wanna make crystal clear, no election files from the November 2020 election have been or ever will be or have ever been deleted and we could retrieve every single one of them right now. We could absolutely retrieve every single file that we have on those 26 uh, archived hard drives. Uh, we even created a final one on November 13th as a just-in-case measure. Okay, and then if I can turn to Scott while we're on techie stuff. So let me, I, I apologize because Supervisor Galvin had a Please. question, so uh, I'm gonna I'll, turn uh, to him and then I'll let, I'll go back to you to ask Scott questions. Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richard, I'll be brief, but I just wanna say that Mr. Young, I really appreciate your presentation today. Oh, thank you. Um, despite the debacle of what the county has been through over the past year and a half, um, especially with Cyber Ninjas and Cypher, I think there's a silver lining here. Um, and the silver lining is what you just spoke about because I think this emphasizes not only what we talk about with the 2020 election, but looking ahead to the 2022 election. And I think people should feel really good about what Maricopa County is doing and the elections department is doing because what you just did was really emphasize that we have safe and secure election equipment and that presentation was excellent and I hope a lot of people see this today and frankly if there's going to be any more question or criticism about what Maricopa County is doing I think what we can do from now on is point to this presentation from the four of you today and what Mr. Young just said and so thank you very, very much for that I really appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you Supervisor Galvin. Supervisor Sellers. Yeah just uh, to quickly reiterate something you already said but to re-emphasize this inner hard drive that was in the machine, the auditors did say that it, there was evidence that it had never been accessed uh, it during, had, during, during the time that we were using it. Correct, that is correct. Uh, last time it was accessed was uh, July 31st, 2019. Thank you. Recorder Richer. Scott, is there a physical ballot for every single vote cast in Maricopa County? Mr. Chairman, Super R. Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richer, um, every there is a physical ballot that was ta tabulated for every single vote that was counted and included in our canvas. So there is no such thing as a digital ballot or a digital vote. Correct. That's correct. Even if you're using the accessible do voting device, we will print out a copy of a hard copy ballot. So let's just imagine this hypothetical, none of which happened. But let's say, even though the EMS server isn't connected to the county, you somehow got past the county firewall, even though there's no evidence that happened. You somehow got through the election management server, even though it's not connected to the internet and is in a room that only a few people can access. You somehow manipulated the tabulation software code, even though you don't have the requisite security tokens and in a post-election assessment, the software code was found to be unaltered. You rewrote the code to show that Trump votes were counted as Biden votes, even though this would show up in the post-election hand count and the post-election logic and accuracy test. And you deleted a bunch of files just for the heck of it. None of this would matter because we still have a physical ballot for every single vote cast. So even if you hacked everything, it wouldn't matter. Even if every electronic file was, didn't, was deleted, it wouldn't matter because Arizona has a very wise and a very good standard to have a physical paper ballot for every single vote cast that could go back and check, be checked. Correct? 
That is correct, and all the claims related to the paper uh, were determined false. Very well put. I think Recorder Richard has been watching Mr. Robot uh, recently. Uh, I don't know what that means, but I'll take well, it. As a we, it's, it's a good. It's a good <laughs> series. It's all about a hacker. You you would enjoy it, Mr. Again, Mr. Young. I couldn't agree more with my colleagues here. Thank you very much, and uh, I have even more confidence in our systems than I did before your presentation. So thank you very much for your service to Maricopa County, Supervisor Hickman. Oh, because I asked Scott this, I, I'm not I'm not sure either, uh, Mr. Young. I, I don't know if we've ever met, but my que my question to you is, I asked what Scott did, but you, you arrived late on the scene, like Mr. Recorder over there that's hectoring the witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> it's an appreciated hector. <laughs> What's your background? Uh, I am a career IT professional. I've been in the industry for 16 years. Uh, started out as a uh, inbound call person, you know, that you would call with your computer issues and uh, eventually uh, came to the county in uh, August of 2018 uh, for the Office of Enterprise Technology. Uh, that's where I was uh, when I transitioned over to uh, the recorder's office and uh, it's been a wild ride ever since. Do you, do you possess any certifications or licenses associated with, with all this experience? I do. Uh, I have a certification in ITIL uh, V4. It's a, it's more of a desktop uh, management uh, style license or a customer service license uh, or certification. And uh, I also have an A-plus certification as well. And, and I'm going to leave it at that because I, I will, will say that this is being broadcast and we've had to deal with this. Uh, here's the story. People are going to know who you are. And um, I appreciate you coming on to the county uh, way prior to your arrival. Uh, this board has always looked for the best of the best, whether it be people that we hire, uh, the county manager hires, or uh, Stephen Richard, a newly elected, comes and entices people. Welcome to the county. I really appreciate your report today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Supervisor Hickman. Mr. Jarrett. Mr. Chairman, now we're going to turn it over to uh, Janine Petty. She is the Senior uh, Director for Overvoter Registration within the Recorder's Office to cover uh, the voters that moved issue and our items and the other, register, other voter registration items. Excellent. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Recorder Richer. Happy to be here today to go over the voter registration portion of this presentation. Um, as we go through, one thing I do want to keep in mind is that there is no real-time database that tracks the day-to-day -day movements and residency changes of a voter um, in our state or in the nation, for that matter. Um, so we cannot deny a voter their right to vote based on the information contained in a commercial database that was used um, in similar to what the Cyber Ninjas provided in this uh, report. Um, the one thing that I do want to do is set some background information um, that is really important. And as a seasoned election official, these are laws that we use um, that they're practically known by the back, like the back of our hand. Um, I don't want to bore you with the, the fine details, but we do have federal and state laws that dictate how we manage um, voter registration and list maintenance. And specifically, the law for decades has recognized that voters move um, during election cycles and has provided safe uh, provisions for these voters to still allow them their right to vote. Um, specifically, uh, under the National Voter Registration Act, um, they actually outline the trusted resource of the United States Postal Service, um, the National Change of Address Program to use in um, updating voters' addresses. But ultimately, it comes down to the voters' affirmation that they say they live at a particular residence, and we um, take that signed affirmation as true. Another um, uh, federal law is the Uniformed Overseas and Absentee Voters Act, which allows voters that are temporarily absent from our state to still maintain their residency here and be able to vote. In addition, there's a ton of other state laws. Um, I've highlighted a few here for you, but basically these acknowledge that a voter can move um, during the election cycle. Voters are allowed to affirm their new address and provide documentation at the polls. Um, voters can move from one county to another after the close of the polls or after the close of the 29-day period, and they're still uh, deemed an elector from the county that they previously resided in for the purposes of voting in that election. 
Um, there's also a law that allows a voter that has moved after uh, between the 30 days uh, immediately preceding the elector in a presidential elector election that the voters still be able to vote those presidential elector race only. And the last one I'll mention is that incomplete registrations that are received by our office, the voter has the opportunity to cure those registrations before 7 p.m. on election day and will still can be considered a eligible elector and registered as of the date that we first received that initial registration. I think had the cyber ninjas understood this general understanding um, as we do as seasoned election officials that their analysis would have been much different. The other op uh, thing that I wanted to talk about was data matching. I think I clicked too many here. Um, as you see here, the Cyber Ninjas had three points of data that they used to identify uh, voters. And we here at Yavapai County under our own, I'm sorry, Maricopa County, uh, did seven points of data. And we list them here, full name, full date of birth, last four social security number, driver's license, residential history, uh, the voter signature, and other information that would have been supplied by the voter. Now, we cannot speak to the reliability or the accuracy of the commercial data that the Cyber Ninjas used, um, but we can speak to the seven points of data that we have and that we used in our analysis. Um, I think that this was touched on a little bit earlier, but um, if you had a John Smith with a year of 1976, as you can imagine, with 2.6 million voters, you would probably have a lot of uh, false matches and that not necessarily be the same voter. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, so we're gonna go real quickly through the actual claims here. Um, we have voters in ballots, uh, mail-in ballots voted from a prior address, voters who moved within Maricopa County, voters who moved out of, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, voters who moved out of Arizona, voters who moved within Arizona, but out of Maricopa County. So we did an analysis um, of these records and we found no occurrences of double voting. Um, in addition, we found no evidence of a voter being ineligible to vote from the residential address that they provided per their signed affidavit um, of legal residence, which is provided um, and authorized under state law. I think it is interesting that uh, some of the information that the cyber ninjas had reported voters moving to PO boxes, um, a pretty typed living quarters there. Uh, but also we cannot use PO boxes as a residential address for voter registration purposes. And, and ultimately listing a PO box in a commercial address does not warrant removal from rules. Can, can we tease that out, if I may, just because I believe it's emblematic of the analysis that Cyber Ninjas did throughout this report. But they allege that some of our voters were voting for an incorrect address because they found through commercial databases that those voters had ostensibly moved to a P.O. box and therefore their address had changed. But under Arizona state law, you can't be registered to vote at a P.O. box and so therefore it still remained their previous mailing address, correct? Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richard, that is correct. And that seems like something somebody with any grounding in elections would know, correct? That is correct. Uh, moving on to some other cyber ninja uh, claims, voters potentially voting in multiple counties, in-person voters who had moved out of Maricopa County and voters that moved out of the state during the 29 day preceding the election. Um, I previously talked about this. Um, voters are uh, moved. We do have uh, laws that allow us to make accommodations for these. Uh, in our analysis, again, using our seven points of data, um, we determined that the Cyber Ninjas incorrectly identified thousands of eligible voters due to their soft matching data techniques. Um, Using our additional data data points, we were able to identify only six potential instances of possible double voting, and those have been turned over to the Attorney General's Office for further investigation. 
I just want to harp on this process because an untold number of hours, hundreds of hours, has gone into researching every single voter file that the cyber ninjas allege to have voted improperly. We didn't just say, oh, their methodology is bad, but we actually went and researched every single voter. And if in the very, very rare instance there was anything that was potentially unlawful, it was referred to the Attorney General. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richard, that is correct. And just to reiterate uh, on that point, now on the last two slides, what's the total number of allegedly questionable ballots that you've, you've addressed here? Mr. Chairman, um, the last two slides, we had one for a little over 20,000 records that they identified, and those we were not unable to find it to substantiate those claims. And, and then, and then the, the numbers on this, these are in addition to the 23,000, the ones on this slide? Mr. Chairman, that's correct. Okay, so now we're, we've got another seven, eight, 10,000. So now we're over 30,000, and we've had six? Six instances of double voting out of over 30,000? Mr. Chairman, that's correct. That's what our findings okay. found. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, so we got this information. You guys been digging into it, and uh, we're receiving questions about why is why are these answers taking three months? You guys, you guys are digging into this all the way to the bottom to the point where you are providing information to the Attorney General's office? I believe there was another event that took place in the intervening time period. Mr. Jarrett, did anything happen in November 2021? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richard, we uh, provided a nearly countywide election, over 1.4 million eligible voters, uh, for, and that occurred during October as well as November. Thanks for bringing that up. So there was, there was the, your, your jobs plus the invest, plus what you guys are trying to do to, to really dig deep into these numbers. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on in our report here. Um, the Cyber Ninjas report also included some additional five claims about the voter registration database, which they claim allowed ineligible voters to vote an official ballot. Our review of this found our voter registration system to, to be very sound. I'll go briefly into these details. Uh, claims about voters with incomplete names. Uh, voters are legally allowed to register with only a first name, last name, or single letter in their first or last name. A voter with a short name, no name, or last name does not indicate that that voter is an in invalid voter. Late registered voters, um, that the, those ballots were counted. Again, state law dictates how we handle this. Uh, voters that show up in the polls on election day that are not found to be in our signature rosters of site books, they still will be, be allowed to vote a provisional ballot. Those are then reviewed by our office. Um, in our analysis of this information, we found no evidence of a voter that registered after the deadline being allowed to cast a ballot. Of multiple voters linked with the affidavit sequence number. An affidavit sequence number is something that's part of our internal process related to forms. Um, it has nothing to do about the integrity of the election process. So the fact that a voter may have had an identical sequence number has nothing to do with this process. Duplicate voter IDs. Uh, Cyber Ninja soft matching techniques, we again found that they had incorrectly identified potential voters that may have been assigned to registration numbers. Again, only using those three um, matching criteria um, seemed to be a, a, a issue that uh, we were able to overcome with using our seven points of data. Um, out of what they identified, um, we could only find 12 voters that had two voter ID numbers, and out of those 12, only six, um, which we referenced um, before in the other slide, were po possible potential double votes. Deceased voters, um, as you can imagine, with over 2.6 million voters in our county, we do have people that pass away, um, thousands that pass away each month. Uh, Cyber Ninjas claim to have found 282 instances of this. However, they did not provide us that um, data. So we independently did our own analysis. Um, what we found that there were 619 voters that passed away during the gap between ballots mailing and the election. Um, of that, 26 possible instances of a ballot 
potentially being processed and counted um, by a voter that passed away during that period. These have been collected and transferred over to the Attorney General's Office for further investigation. And I just want to emphasize that the 200-some allegations made by the Cyber Ninjas regarding deceased voters participating in the November 2020 election were not provided, that this was sua sponte, that we did this just because we want to improve our system, and we did forward those to the Attorney General, and they are a bad thing, but they are a de minimis thing. Mr. Chairman, Gercorda Richard, that is correct. Okay, wrapping up my presentation here, um, just want to again say that the analysis that was conducted by some uh, cyber ninjas, um, what we found during our analysis is that our election policies and practices will comply and adhere to federal and state law, and what we do is, is sound and compliant. Um, of course, the Maricopa County Recorder's Office is always looking for ways to not only maintain the integrity of our roles, but um, exceed in our elections and voter registration processing. And some points that I just want to, to briefly touch on is the fact that we are now requesting and receiving uh, ERIC deceased reports. ERIC is the Electronic uh, Registration Information Center. We are a member of that. And we are now getting monthly deceased reports for them, from them, as well as cross-state mover reports from other ERIC member states. States. Um, we are reviewing our system soft matching criteria in the voter registration database to see if we can cast a wider net for some possible duplicates in the system, especially with some older uh, records from the database. And one exciting thing that we're looking to do um, in the future is uh, revitalize our voter registration system. Um, our system is, is old, um, it's functioning, but it needs a facelift, and we are looking forward to, to doing that and streamlining our workflow and up obviously complying with new law and legislation that, as it comes to us. Um, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my presentation. Um, I don't know if you have any questions for me. Uh, thank you. E excellent presentation. Any questions from my colleagues? Yeah, I'll go last, but if I may. Yes, please. Okay. So of the 53,304 alleged impacted ballots, what did your and your team's analysis find were actually potentially questionable ballots? What number? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richer, we had 26, we had I think 32 like, that we have transferred over to the Attorney General Office for further investigation. And those 32 are, are indicators of individual wrong behavior, not actions taken by Maricopa County staff or personnel, correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richard, that is correct. So just as we cannot police people from not doing drugs, we cannot police people from not doing wrong things with respect to voting, correct? Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richard, that is correct. But we can refer that to the Attorney General whenever we come across such potential instances, and we have done so, correct? Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richard, exactly. We have done our own analysis and upon ourselves have collected this data and transferred it over for further investigation. And so much of this comes from the fact that they were working with only three data points and a commercial database, whereas we were working with the official voter registration database and seven data points. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richard, that is correct. Um, I also, as a key point, um, we did learn that a another county in our state actually did an experiment with a commercial set of data, and they found only 14% of the data contained in that report to be um, useful. So I believe this was Yavapai County that used a commercial database and said this is garbage, correct? Maybe not in those words. Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richard, I, I wouldn't say in those terms, but um, they did not find it to be a trusted source or resource that they would want to continue to use. Now, your familiarity with state law and voter registration law is the result of, you previously said Yavapai, and that's because <laughs> you were previously with the Yavapai County Recorder's Office and then moved to the Secretary of State's office under Michelle Reagan and then under Secretary Hobbs and then before we poached you away at the Maricopa County Recorder's Office, correct? Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richard, that is correct. I'm a self-proclaimed election geek. Okay, you are a certified election officer, I believe, and a CIRA certified elections person as well? Yes, I am. 
And when did you join the recorder's office? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Recorder Richard, I joined, joined May 2021. And we are so excited to have you and we look forward to continuing to work on our voter registration database. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richer. And, and just to uh, use my show, show your work uh, analogy from earlier, I think in this instance, the Cyber Ninjas did show their work, right? It was the three data points, and we showed our work, and it's seven data points. So if anyone wants to grade that, I think we got an A, and they got somewhere in the D or F range, just to make it very clear. And I want everyone to understand that, that they jump, talk about jumping to conclusions. They did it uh, in immeasurable ways, and I thank you guys to reiterate this again, for taking the time uh, to go through those seven levels and to establish the facts here. And I think everyone needs to be aware of that who has any concerns about the integrity of our election. So thank you very much for that presentation. Mr. Jarrett, unless there are any other questions. Stephen asked mine. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Recorder Richard, you asked us to do some quick math, and please don't ask me to do quick math on the spot again. Um, but it, we actually uh, referred 37 um, out of the just over 53,000 ballots that Cyber Ninjas found. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'm now going to turn it over to Celia Nabor. She's our assistant director for early voting, and she'll cover uh, the claims related to early ballots and the Echo Mail report, which covered signature verification. Um, that brings me to something about the heavy hand of the law. We looked at this, and of all those thousands of people that were questioned by Cyber Ninjas, and you guys went up with 37. Think about all the door knocks that will not happen uh, to people that Cyber Ninjas wanted us to go knock on a door from the Attorney General's office. So think about that when someone's walking down your driveway and going to and operating on false information, and you just stop that. Now I, I don't know what's going to happen with the 37 others, but it could have been thousands if we would have followed their procedures. Thank you. Ms. Nabor, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Recorder Richard. Uh, today I'm going to be going over 19 claims. These are claims from Echo Mail and Cyber Ninjas. Uh, for the most part, they are focused in signature verification and misunderstanding election reports that we, that we run. Next slide. Okay, I am gonna to refer to two important milestones that occurred in the summer of 2020. Number one is all statewide, the Secretary of State hosted a, a training on signature verification that was provided virtually because we were in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, it was a virtual training provided by forensic handwriting experts uh, who also have trained previously the FBI. So that was one uh, statewide training that was provided. They also released the signature verification guide. That guide outlined all of the characteristics and the technique methodology which we were to adopt in analyzing these signatures. Now, it's important to point out uh, that in Maricopa County, uh, in the general election, uh, the early voting division managed 1.9 million ballots. So when I talk about the signature verification processes, this team managed and reviewed 100% of those signature records on those green affidavit envelopes. Now, you, what you have on the screen and these are the guidelines that were outlined in the Secretary of State Signature Verification Guide. I have heard um, references to 29 point, 27 point, um, an accusation that at some point in the election, we just told the staff to stop looking at signatures completely, which is completely false. We did not tell staff to stop looking at signatures. That would be illegal. Um, so. With that record straight, we also um, 
we have very robust curing processes. Uh, but first, I'm going to go over what the screen looks like. I'm putting this up just as a reference so I can speak to it later on in the presentation. Now, the green affidavit envelope is unique to each voter. It's unique to each voter and unique to each election. It has a barcode on it. That barcode allows us to track exactly where that ballot is within the process. In fact, voters have visibility into where their ballot is. They can go on to be balloted.vote and see exactly where it is. is is it, uh, has it been signature verified? Is there an issue with it that they need to then call us back to mitigate what that issue is? Uh, they can also opt in to get text message and email notifications. So that barcode is very powerful, unique to the voter, and allows them to know visibility into exactly where it is within our systems. We pick those ballots up at the post office or they're brought in by our bipartisan board, our bipartisan team couriers who bring them into McTech. There's a series of custody, transfer of custody documents that are completed and that are filled and maintained. With this, we then run an inbound scan on all of those packets. Inbound scan is basically taking an image of every single packet. Now, on our team, we do signature verification. That signature clipping is capturing the region that you can see to the right. It includes the signature, the phone number, and a date um, if the voter chooses to put their phone number or their date. Now, Echo Mail, was very clear and mentioned that their scope was limited to only look at the signature portion. Um, I'll refer to that a little bit later. So a, a, a different scope in what they were actually looking at. So our system is specific to Maricopa County, our signature verification system. It does have three layers to it, the user level. Now that user is just looking at one historical signature that has been previously deemed approved. They have one decision point, that is to determine is it good or is it an exception. If it's deemed an exception, it does go on to the manager queue. The manager then has an entire history of signatures. So if we're talking about a voter who has been diligent about voting over time, we can have upwards of 20 signature examples that were previously deemed approved that we can now do our handwriting analysis against to try to verify the signature. The third level is an audit. An audit is done on 2%, so a batch of 10,000, we do a 2% audit on that. So three different levels. Now, during signature verification, if we can verify that signature, meaning it's a good signature, that goes through and eventually ends up on with our processing boards bipartisan teams who are going to process those packets, those trays with all the audit documentation. They are going to prepare them so that we can count them. Now, I'll move on to curing. Curing is when a signature cannot be verified. Now, just to be clear about what curing is, the voter has the opportunity to mitigate an issue. In this case, I'm just gonna focus on two of the large majority of the issues, which is questionable signatures. We don't have anything in our history, our records, where we can say, yes, we believe this signature was signed by this voter. And then no signature, meaning we cannot find a signature anywhere on that packet, including in the specific signature region. Uh, so this is all outlined in law. Questionable signature, voters have a deadline five business days post-election. Uh, that's important to mention because there were several claims made about um, activities that were identified post-election, which is true. Uh, curing a questionable signature, a voter has the opportunity to do that. In this election, it was up to November 10th that they could call us to cure their signature. Next up on a questionable signature pathway is we have a stamp, which also received a lot of attention. It's a verified and approved stamp. Now that stamp is only applied on a packet when we have done our due diligence. Time and effort has been put into 
contacting the voters, sending letters, making phone calls, any way that we can communicate with them to try to get them to mitigate and confirm that yes, in fact, I did sign that affidavit. At that point, then we do place the stamp on that green affidavit envelope. Uncured packets, meaning we were never able to get the voter to confirm that it was their signature. Those are left in sealed, they're left in their sealed envelope. We never open envelopes until they are cured. So that's important to mention because it was, um, misinformation was provided during the echo mail presentation in which they stated that every packets are actually opened when they're going through the scanning process, which is not true. Only good signatures are actually opened and processed. Now moving on to no signature, those basically, those end uh, election night, 7 p.m. So if we have not heard back from voters, then those are gonna be deemed on the canvas as a no signature. Can I pause you just to globally capture that? Yes. So 1.9 roughly of the 2.1 million ballots cast in the November 2020 election went through the signature review process, correct? Correct. And you send in the ballot and an image is taken of the ballot and that's when the signature process begins, the signature matching process, correct? Correct. And the envelope is not, or the ballot is not taken out of the envelope until the signature is confirmed as good, correct? Correct. And if you mess up or if you don't sign it, which a shocking number of people do, you effectively get a mulligan according to Arizona state law, correct? Correct. And that allows Maricopa County to call up to 7 p.m. on election day if you haven't signed it, and five business days after if it's a bad SIG to try and confirm that it was indeed you, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh you raised a good point that I forgot to mention. One I, thing. Excuse me. Looks like uh, Mr. Liddy has a, a comment. I apologize. When my lawyer raises his hand, I tend to, you know, call on him. When the affidavit envelope comes in, a digital image is taken of the of the affidavit envelope with the signature. Correct. Not of the ballot because the ballot's still in the envelope and hasn't been opened. Correct. It's, it's taken good. of the. Affidavit envelope, yeah. not of Thank the you for that clarification. Apologies. That was probably me. <laughs> uh, can you go back one slide, please? I, I didn't mention one important point. Important point in curing is, as I previously mentioned, we're taking an inbound scan. That is the initial first image that we have. Now, if we cure a packet, we are going to run it through an inbound scan again to capture that image again. So we would uh, see for a cured packet, we would see multiple images, which I'm gonna refer to in a little bit. Okay, so for echo mail claims, the first claim that I want to review is specific to that scanning process. So in this case, they identified 17,126 unique voters that they indicated had, had submitted or returned more than one ballot. So that was a misunderstanding of what they were looking at, lack of election uh, processes, especially curing processes. What they were really looking at was an original affidavit that had been cured, and so then you would see a second image. Voters did not submit two ballots. Voters did not get two ballots counted. These were two images of their green affidavit envelope. And your team went through and actually checked to confirm that none of those voters, those voters in that alleged 17,000 pool had cast more than one ballot, correct? Yes, we did, we did analyze the data. So what Echo Mail was looking at was multiple captures of an image of an affidavit envelope that had gone through the curing process, not multiple ballots from a voter, correct? Correct. Moving on to their next claim. Uh, this claim was specific to 
uh, they indicated that we had more uh, affidavit envelopes than they received, which is true. Uh, as Director Jarrett previously mentioned and we'll discuss shortly, there are certain affidavit images they did not receive. The law does not allow us to share, um, for example, protected voters. Those are judges, law enforcement. We are required to protect their data, so they did not receive those. So. That is a misleading claim. Moving on to the next. Uh, this is specific to curing. So the statement was made that compared to 2016, uh, we sent out more early voting ballots to voters, but we rejected less. And rejected means a, a bad signature or a no signature. Now, those are reported out on the canvas in that way. So essentially, their claim was that we rejected less. And the answer is very simple here, and that is that there was a law change in 2019. And that law allowed voters the five business days post-election day to cure their ballot. So that was, of course, we we saw the, the decrease in rejects because of that very significant law change. And on top of that, during our planning efforts, we were planning for a high volume uh, early voting drop off on election day. And that in fact happened, uh, over 170,000 ballots were dropped off on that day that were received on time. We prepared for that ahead of time. We hired on 40 staff that staffed us seven days. That was October 30th to November 6th. They supported us. They were a night shift. They came and they helped us make phone calls and voters were very responsive. The effort was highly successful because we suspect voters were home. So these staff were coming, they worked a 5 to 10 p.m. shift. Voters were answering their phone and they were confirming that yes, in fact, I did sign that affidavit envelope. Yeah. And, and this is the thanks that your team gets, clearly, because you cured more ballots, which in effect means that more voters got their vote to ultimately count, right? Correct. I mean, this is shocking in its laziness, and this is on page 15, and I had marked it because he says that simply because fewer ballots were deemed bad sig in 2016 than were deemed bad sig in 2020, therefore something must be wrong. I mean, the, you know, all of us who have taken the LSAT up here are going, whoa, 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 that doesn't logically follow. Not to mention you don't do the 15 seconds worth of research to find out one, we got more electronic machines, which allows it helps with this process. Two, the law got changed to allow for five business days after election night to do this. So yes, and then you hired 40 people to do this. So I, I, I mean, just the answer is so readily avail, available that it's it's alarming. Yeah, and just to follow up, that, I mean, it's an example of great customer service. One, we're being criticized for it. And two, who changed the law? The Senate. So again, I, I, I couldn't agree more with your frustration and really just being shocked. And to speak to that point, we also embrace a continuous quality improvement uh, culture. And one thing we did is standardized some of the items. One example is we adopted a label of documenting all the contacts, which was a very clear visual management of allowing us to visually just look at an affidavit to identify how many times we had contacted voters. So I mentioned that because we did look to standardize many of the processes, which increased efficiencies and allowed, allowed us to be highly effective in our curing efforts. Moving on to a related topic is also curing. So the claim was that there was all of a sudden a surge in duplicates uh, post election. And again, I want to um, reiterate, these are not duplicate voters submitting multiple ballots. These were images of cured packets. And it falls right in line with the timeline they identified because that was the curing period. This was post-election. Our priorities then shifted to managing, number one, the 170,000 plus ballots we received election night, and number two, making sure that we were 
fully being diligent about contacting voters to be able to cure their packets up until the 10th of November. So it does align. Uh, there is nothing suspicious about that because it was curing activities that caused that surge. Moving on to the next. Now, I'm going to go through a few examples. Uh, these were actually examples that were ca called out specifically in the Echo Mail presentation as well as their written report. Now, th uh, we did, uh, the Canvas does have uh, bad signatures, which I mentioned. Uh, there was a claim that your, your uh, bad signatures decreased, which is true. Uh, for the reasons that I just shared, but they also... Supervisor Hick, my, my apologies, Supervisor yes. Hickman oh, yeah, had I'm a sorry, question. Just real quickly, because I'm trying to remember how the Senate hearing went and who was who was Echo Mail. What, what contractor was Echo Mail that gave testimony to the Senate? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman, that was Dr. Shiva. The Dr. Shiva, okay. All right, I lose track. Okay, thank you. And that was, by the way, I just mentioned Dr. Shiva was asked to come and testify to Congress, but I guess he chose at the last second the not, to, not to testify when we did. So just thought I'd mention that. The claim here was that they found more bad signatures than we had reported on the canvas. And they claim that we did not count scribbles. Now, uh, the scribbles and the example that they actually shared during their presentation, one thing that's part of our standard process, when we get the physical packet, and by packet I mean the sealed envelope uh, that we need to follow up on, work with the voter to cure, we visually and, and physically look at that packet because there's a chance that the voter signs somewhere else on the packet and, or they may have used a writing instrument that didn't image well. And the exact example that they used in their report is exactly what a gel pen image is like. Uh, and we cannot disenfranchise voters uh, based on their writing instrument. We can, we can work to cure that packet because for a gel pen, you can actually see the signature very clearly when it's in front of you. But again, it doesn't image well um, to be able to do, do it on the computer. So we do not disenfranchise voters for scribbles. And we also know that there are expected reasons why a signature changes over time with maturity, with deterioration of age, with medical reasons such as stroke victims of, you know, we all know probably have a family member that suffers from a medical issue that impacts their handwriting. Uh, so we cannot, again, dis disenfranchise voters uh, for what, what they label, label as a scribble. Moving on to the next examples, they also, Echo Mail also claims that they found uh, more uh, affidavits that were not signed at all or blank uh, than we reported in our canvas. Now, these are just a few examples. Again, voters have up until election night, 7 p.m., to be able to cure a no signature packet. Uh, cured packets are not duplicate packets. And then again, we do physically review the packet when we receive it. These are examples that they included in the report. And they're actually perfect examples because they really speak to the process of signature verification. The one to the left is the original image that was scanned. So of course, those are both appear to be um, blank in the signature region. Um, we then deem those as exceptions. We bring them in, we follow up on them, we contact the voter. And these examples, uh, these, if you look at the bottom one, you can actually see letter forms underneath that phone number redaction box. So that's one example. And then up at the top, that is an example of a voter that successfully cured their, their packet. So as one of their shining examples, and I was amazed that they presented this to the Senate of a no signature on the affidavit envelope, it was staring us right there in the face behind the phone number box instead of, so it wasn't in the signature box, but it was clearly underneath the phone number box, and yet they presented this as, aha, we found one that, act, that didn't have a signature, correct? Correct. 
why uh, looking at these redacted things? Is that is that the image taken directly from? Um, is that the image that was uh, at the on the Senate report, or is that that's redacted because we redacted it for this report? Is there? Because uh, I can't see the signatures, or I, I'm assuming those are signatures and information. What is that? Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Hickman, those are images that were provided to the Senate. The Senate then worked with Echo Mail to run an analysis on these images. And then Echo Mail placed these images redacted with those boxes over them into their report and into their presentation. So these are images taken. I'm using them as a demonstration to show uh, their they are telling of the curing process, not of two ballots being sent in by a voter as they claimed. Okay. Moving on to the next is uh, they claimed that we had multiple uh, stamps on an affidavit. In this case, this would be an example of a bipartisan board going out to serve a voter uh, who's either ill, they're disabled, they're not able to uh, go to a vote center. So we send a team out. This is a bipartisan team that goes out. When they arrive on site, they do uh, uh, require identification from the voter to ensure that Yes, that in fact is the voter. They then provide services and they would stamp that affidavit uh, if the voter is unable to sign on their own or make their own marking. We have, ident we have uh, visually verified their identification. So we will stamp the affidavit and then that bipartisan team will then write their name on the green affidavit in the voter assistance section. This next claim, uh, uh, Ms. Petty has already talked about the soft matches. So this is an example of a soft match. I do want to point out this is an example that they placed and they claimed that this is the same, the same name, two different voter IDs, same address, the same phone number, but that the, the signature was the same. And although they have redacted this image, you can see that there are different letters. So to the left, that example has an initial stroke that drops down below the boundary. So you can clearly see that. In the second example to the right, you do not see that same letter stroke going below the boundary. So again, we did not get these examples of we saw them in the redacted report, uh, but just visually looking at it in this way, they do not appear to be the same signature. And again, um, it is possible to have two individuals in the same household that have the same name, for example, a junior and a senior. Now moving on to what they uh, Echo Mail declared as a potential critical anomaly. Now, when they described this, they did use words such as photoshopped or imaged onto the affidavit, which is false. We did not image this stamp onto the affidavit envelope. We did not photoshop this onto the envelope. As I mentioned earlier, we do stamp cured packets with this stamp. Now, when our inbound scan is done, it creates a binary image. Now, a binary image is standard in the industry in mail sorting. Uh, the goal of binary image is to increase efficiency, uh, readability, and decrease size of the actual file. Now, in this example, you can see it has a, an appearance of being hollowed out, uh, specifically the red areas. So side by side, you can see everything that is bold red color now has a hollowed out appearance. So that is why that stamp appears to be behind the triangle, is not because it was imaged on there, it's because it is a bind binary image, which again is standard in the industry. 
Now I'll quickly move through the next um, the next few slides and that the next slides are specific to the claims by Cyber Ninja. Uh, most of these claims are misunderstanding of our election reports. And then another claim on our use of our site books, uh, which are the check-in systems at the, the vote centers. So first I'll go over the site books. Uh, the claim was that we were operating out of, we didn't have statutory authority to issue a standard ballot to a voter if they were to go to a vote center that we should be issuing a provisional ballot instead of a standard ballot if they had already received a mail ballot. Now, I want to say that we have an award-winning uh, system, a site book that is developed by our internal IT team, which is very talented individuals who have created this system. Now, what the system, do system does is it has a secure connection to our voter registration system. And when a voter checks in at the vote center on the site book, the system is able to identify, is this a, an eligible voter and then have they already cast that mail ballot. If they have not cast the mail ballot, the mail ballot can then be voided and a ballot can be issued while they are at the vote center. So at no time are there two live ballots for that voter. There is one ballot um, if the system comes back and, and indicates that the voter is eligible to vote that standard ballot. So. Uh, in the report, Cyber Ninjas indicated that they did not find any um, instances where voters voted that should not have voted a standard ballot. They just wanted to point out that we did not have permission to be using this technology, uh, which is uh, we have been using it under three county recorder administrators, and it was approved under uh, Secretary Reagan. Uh, moving on to our election files. Now, I have this grid uh, simply just to demonstrate that all of these reports, these four reports that were misunderstood and used to come to false conclusions, were these are not intended to be used uh, together. Now, the first two, which are the EV32 request, uh, this report tells us uh, ballots that have been requested, specifically early ballots that have been requested. Uh, this is uh, written in law that we are required to provide the political parties these reports, and really they use these reports to further get out, get out the vote efforts, which Director Jarrett previously discussed. Now, important timeline for this report is that this report is run and captured all requests up to the 11th day before the election. That date is written in law as well. For the general election, we provided that report October 1st through the 23rd. Now, there were many attempts to use that report with the EV33 report, uh, which you can clearly see those are different dates, different data. They are not meant to reconcile. Uh, the, this EV33 return report tells us how many uh, have been returned back to us, and it reflects the curing efforts. So I want to go back to what I mentioned about curing and that you would have multiple images of an affidavit, the original and the cured. And so all of those will be accounted for in this report. It is not a list of counted ballots. And it is different timelines. So we produce that port report up until one day before the election. The VM55 voted report, now that is the final accounting of the election and voters that participated in the election. It is broken down by early day, early voting and election day. And then last is our VM34 monthly voter roll file that does contain all the active and inactive voters. Now, I will just summarize the next few slides by saying many conclusions were drawn by trying to combine all of these different reports. Again, they are different variables, they provide different information, and there was an attempt to use them all together to come to these conclusions. But this wasn't the first attempt, correct? Correct. So rolling the tape back to July, 
the Cyber Ninjas in their first presentation to Warren Peterson and Senator Fan, Senator Peterson and Senator Fan, alleged 74,000 phantom voters. In all of about 15 minutes, Journalists Jeremy Duda of The Mirror and Garrett Archer of ABC 15 looked at this, said they'd been misusing these voter files and said, this is what you've done wrong. The Cyber Ninjas said, oops. Unfortunately, President Trump repeated that claim when he was here in Phoenix. Senate liaison Ken Bennett said that was, quote, frustrating. And yet, despite that, Despite such an obvious error that would be readily apparent to any election official, people continued to think that their later report would have any measure of credence, and they continued to make the exact same errors that they made in July, correct? Correct. So the 9,000, I'll just specifically speak to this one because it was, it was a larger number, is this is, again, tied to uh, cyber ninjas analyzing a report and not understanding the curing process and that you would see multiple entries because of the curing process. M Mr. Chairman, can I interject briefly? Please. So the cyber ninjas issued a response because we had put out a just the facts report that explained this and they said that they went through and analyzed the images from Dr. Shiva and they couldn't find that same number, the 9,000. So we went through and looked at the exact images that we had provided to Echo Mail and then identified a one for one match on all of those. So we were able to to match up why there was a curing. There was a handful that didn't, and that was because they were cured after election day, not in the EV30. So they would not be included in the EV33 file. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the next is again, another example of not understanding uh, the election reports. Same for the other three claims as well, not understanding the reports and attempting to use them all together. Do you want me to go into depth? Or... Okay. Mr. Chairman? Supervisor while, while Hickman. You're, while you're getting set up for that, I wanted to just uh, talk about the, uh, the ballots and the signatures because uh, we lived it. Um, I, I have a specific question for uh, Mr. Liddy, if he could come up. Mr. Liddy? Thank you. Tom, there's, there's, uh, there's quite a lot of uh, talk about different court cases, all of these types of things just falling by the wayside, and you, pretty soon you get snow blind to it. Was, it. was it 30 across the country? Was it 50? Was it 70? I'm familiar with one uh, because it got to the point where there was some, um, where there was some evidence put in front of a judge. And I know you're familiar with it because you were in the courtroom and I know that you called me, I think every night at the end of the courtroom to discuss what was, what was going on. And it has a lot to do with signature verification and it also has a lot to do with taking these shots about signature verification and you guys, you guys uh, did this wrong. It was in a courtroom Somebody that was telling us that we were doing it wrong was the head of our Republican Party, and she was in the courtroom. Now we're discussing the Cyber Ninjas report about signature verification. So I, I, I have to wonder if some people that were in that courtroom didn't call the Cyber Ninjas and said this was actually vetted out in front of people. But that's that thing about the falling by the wayside and the snow blind of, well, the courts and the judges are just throwing us out. Can you, I think we know what the, the case we're talking about. Can you specifically walk us through that case, what was seen, what occurred, and why it was thrown out? Well, there, there were a lot of cases. I know, I know. Uh, this particular one, um, the evidence that was put on in the court, very similar to test to the presentation you just heard. It was um, a demonstration done at MCTAC where a far larger number of uh, demonstratives were used for the benefit of the Superior Court judge. And they went through all the seven point techniques and they used many different examples 
of the process that was used. And the plaintiff side, that would be um, Chairman Kelly Ward's side, had their own expert that was there watching in signature verification. The Secretary of State had experts, and we had experts in there. And at the end, all of the experts agreed that the process that was used was outstanding, including one expert said it was the best that he had ever seen in all of the signature verifications that they had looked at. Now, these experts primarily were used by banks, and they're looking for fraud. The detail of which the Maricopa County team went was far, far deeper than what they're used to, but that's because they're verifying to find out whether a municipality should take a voter's uh, franchise away from them or not, not you know, dealing with banking records. Completely a different sort of thing. And uh, during that presentation, the court asked that um, we review a whole lot of these, and, and they did. And it was found that this verification process was outstanding, and, was, and the allegations made against Maricopa County uh, did not meet the standard, and claims were thrown out. Yeah, if I can recall, the expert that was brought in by uh, the state GOP even, corrobor even corroborated thing, and maybe that's why maybe that's why the GOP's expert didn't talk to Dr. Shiva, uh, because I don't know if he was aware that this already was th uh, put in front of a judge. Well, and Dr. Shiva is the, uh, the PhD recipient from MIT, and he's the only PhD recipient from MIT who ever's got his butt kinked by a triangle. <laughs> oh. Okay, Clint. Yeah, you bring up a good point, and I think it needs to be restated that this was not the first external assessment of the signature review process in the 2020 election. The case that Clint is referring to is called Ward versus Jackson. And in that, Judge Warner, after having reviewed through two expert forensic analysts, one of plaintiff, one of defendant, wrote, two forensic document examiners testified, one for plaintiff and one for defendants. Plaintiff's forensic document examiner found no sign of forgery or simulation as to any of these ballots. Defendant's expert, too, found no sign of forgery or simulation and found no basis for rejecting any of the signatures. He goes on to write, these ballots were admitted at trial and the court heard testimony about them and reviewed them. None of them shows an abuse of discretion on the part of the reviewer. So uh, this whole process was asked and answered. And to continue on with the falsity that the election had fraud is to discount the work that's been done in over 60 courts, including 10 here in Arizona, is to discount the work that is done by law enforcement, is discount to discount the work that is done by prosecutors, and is to ignore something that was written by a superior court judge after looking at evidence, and guess what? Unanimously affirmed by the Arizona Supreme Court. And Mr. Chairman, also the thing about scribbles, I mean, I, I, I was listening to that, and I remembered how my grandmother's uh, signature changed after her stroke. She kept voting. I represent Sun City, Sun City West, a lot of those people, the thing about people that died, that's why I brought up the law enforcement thing. Some, somebody, some law enforcement officer is gonna, would have walked up a, a, a driveway of a family member who actually might have passed away and did everything right. And they have to answer for that again. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Hickman. Thank you. Uh, and I'll close that section just um, by s stating many wrong claims, wrong assumptions were made based on a, a severe and egregious uh, lack of understanding our election reports. Now I'll move on to just briefly the, the Cyber Ninja claims around UO Cava ballots. Now, as uh, Ms. Petty previously mentioned, UO Cava voters have um, rights that are specific to them uh, based on federal law. So in this case, there were three specific claims uh, about UO Cava voters or UO Cava ballots. Um, next slide, please. Okay, number one is a claim that we submitted wrong information that was 
n not the full number of ballots that we received from Yulkava voters, which to put it simply is just incorrect. We don't know where Cyber Ninjas found their data source, where they got the misinformation, but we verified that we did submit the correct information and it is listed here on the screen. Mr. Chairman, I also wanted to point out that when they were reporting that, they looked up a report, it's the Eves report, where all jurisdictions report this figure, and they were referencing the wrong section of the Eves report. If they would have scrolled down and looked at the right section, they would have found the right number. Thank you, Mr. Jarrett. And the last two claims I'll be addressing are also specific to Yokava. Uh, the first one, that is an image that they put into their file. We have blurted out uh, to comply with the law. It is illegal to post images of ballots. So we have blurted out in this presentation. Um, but in this example, the claim was that we double counted uh, Uokava ballots. Uh, not correct. Uh, these Uokava voters, they're located all over the world. They can submit their voted ballot and sign affidavit back to us through uh, a secure portal upload, through mail, and through fax. And of course, if there are two individuals in a family who live in the same household and they are going to fax the ballots, they would be using the same machine. So in that case, um, these are not one ballot counted twice. These are just examples of fax ballots. Uh, next, moving on to the last claim. This one is pretty straightforward and that the claim is we did not properly identify UOCAVA ballots in the boxes that we submitted to, that we transferred custody to the Senate. Uh, we did not have any statutory obligation to manifest those boxes, uh, but we have adopted, we have adopted a new labeling system. Um, CQI always looking to improve, so we adopted that for the last election and that our labels have more information on them, uh, the labels that are affixed to the boxes of ballots. And so with that, I close my presentation. Are there any questions? Questions from my colleagues? Uh, Clint's looking at me expectedly. Okay, I'll point out one more thing just for clarification. You're, so uniform and overseas are the only people we treat differently in the election space, and they're allowed to transmit their ballots through a non-normal process, correct? Correct. And one of those processes is faxing it. Correct. And so uh, Echo Mail made the inaccurate assumption that because they got two ballots from the same fax machine, that therefore that person must have voted twice, right? Uh, it was Cyber Ninjas that made that okay. claim, and correct. But what had really happened was just two family members who used the fa same fax machine sent back two valid votes for two valid registered voters, correct? Correct. Thank you. And then I just want to point out one other thing just to demonstrate the type of thing that we were dealing with throughout this whole process and the level of professionalism of some of the subcontractors that were enlisted by the Cyber Ninjas. Bill, I'm gonna count for you to, to cut me off at some point in this to, if, I, if I go too far afield. I will. All right, thank you. Um, but shortly following the September presentation at which Echo Mail presented and made these inaccurate allegations, two journalists, one specifically Jeremy Duda, took to the internet and wrote an article that rebutted everything that Echo Mail had stated. Echo Mail then deemed it fit to write a response report, which for some reason the Senate has not posted to its audit website. And in that report on page 10, he says, October 1, 2021, America Maricopa County election officials effectively use a proxy at an unknown blog, Arizona Mirror, to unleash a racist smear campaign. The inability of Maricopa County election officials and their loyal scribe to keep in line a dark-skinned Indian, East Indian American is the real source of this real racism. Their racist attack aimed to shame me back into the segregationist box of behavior that they deem acceptable for a person of my background. I'll go on. To those who unleashed this racism against me, they expected me to be the quote, good Indian. Sorry, homie don't play that game, never will. 
Needless to say, we find this offensive. Needless to say, this did not factor into our, any of our accounts. And needless to say, this is the type of outlandish statements untethered to reality that this office has been subjected to throughout this entire process, and we categorically denounce everything that was in that response report. Thank you, Mr. Richer. Any other questions from Ms. Nabor? I'll, uh, I'll ask a Supervisor question. Hickman. I'll ask a question. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I don't even play one on TV, Tom, and <laughs> all of you LSAT guys that are sitting up here. Sorry, Jack, you and I are <laughs> out to lunch. Um, I want to throw up this uh, the UOCAVA ballot uh, slide again, if you guys can hear me. Okay. Uh, was this was this part of a presentation uh, made uh, at the state legislature? This this slide, or or is it just for us? No, that this image was included in their presentation. Uh, I want to read this because I don't think any of you guys can read it. No, to comply with the Arizona Constitution's guarantee of secrecy of the ballot, as well as A A R S. Jeez. One six, my eyes, one six, one zero. Well, the statute's there. Yeah, go ahead. For the record, <laughs> ARS 16 10184, which prohibits showing voted ballots in a way that reveals the contents. We have blurred the images taken from the Echo Mail presentation. So, am I to take this that in the presentation, in the floor of where they make laws, a law was broken in plain view? of everyone on both the internet and the legislative floor in front of Senator uh, Fan and, and Senator Peterson? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman, we can confirm that this image was shown in that presentation and then was also posted on the website where this report was included. So it was, not, it was not blurred, it was not redacted. I was, because I was asking the question about the other redaction and I, I, I think I understand the laws, but I just wanted to point that out that of what we've been dealing with about the laws. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman, we're not, we can't determine what's allowed or legal or yeah, against I'm the not, law. I'm, but gonna, I'm not gonna ask you are correct. To I'm, I'm, and I'm not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I'm just a representative here trying to get to the, the truth. And mm -hmm. and uh, that's, to me, that's, as a, as a layman, it's just kind of stunning. Um, we don't make laws here. This is not our, this is I, not our field. I, I think your point was well made, Supervisor Hickman. Okay. And we'll, we'll put that under another one of the rhetorical questions, right, for okay. you guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you, anything further? No, sir. Okay, perfect. All right, Mr. Jarrett, what's next? Mr. Chairman, we have a few items left to cover. We'll go okay. through those um, briefly. The, I've covered the next one uh, in my initial remarks or in the opening slides about protected voters. And it, again, this was a misuse of the voted file, um, the VM55, and trying to compare that to the official Canvas report um, because we protected the identities of uh, law enforcement officers, judges, uh, harassment victims. Uh, they were not included in the, in the VM55 report, and we don't create public records. Um, even identifying, acknowledging that we have the protected voters and how many there are, so that's why we've not included that exact amount on this slide or in our report. But there are a couple other situations that cause there to be variances, and they're probably not known, um, are well known. And it can happen, a such, such an item is a fled voter. And that is when a voter shows up to a voting location and they check in, we print them their ballot, and for some reason they decide not to vote that ballot, and then they don't stick around and work with the poll workers to back out that check-in from the check-in station. While this is very, very rare, and it only happened 17 times in the November 2020 general election, it does happen, um, and, uh, and they didn't stay, so we could pull that voter out of that system, they'd get credit, for voting, and so they'd show up in the voted file, but there wouldn't be a ballot included in the canvas. Um, and there's also a situation where voters do return their affidavit envelope to us. It's signed, and during the November 2020 general election, they were given credit. However, the affidavit envelope would be empty. 
And there wouldn't be a ballot that corresponds with that affidavit envelope that ultimately gets counted. Now, since the November 2020 general election, we've implemented a process, continuous improvement, to identify those voters that returned an empty affidavit envelope and then remove them from getting credit. So in future elections, they won't show up in the voted file. The next item we'll cover is related to damage and duplicated ballots. Uh, so when we, we're, when we go through this, the duplication process, um, it's to ensure that we're counting votes for every voter, right? So there are instances where voters will return a ballot that's damaged to it. It's torn. There's coffee spills. There's other items on it that will prevent it from being able to be tabulated. We've also discussed the UOCAVA voters. So those are military and overseas voters. They return their ballots to us through, uh, we saw an image of one that came through a fax. They also use secure portals. We have to print those onto standard paper. That paper cannot be then read by our tabulation equipment. So we have to go through a duplication process. So the Cyber Ninjas make five different claims related to damaged and duplicated ballots. We found that every single one of those was inaccurate. Um, their first claim was that they just found fewer original ballots than what we duplicated. And we can't say why that happened. Um, we do know that there were instances reported by the Secretary of State's office and their observers of them dumping over boxes um, of, of the damaged ballots. So that could be a case. We already know that their hand count process wasn't entirely accurate, so that could be an instance. But what we do know is we have a record from our duplication system of every ballot that we duplicated, and that totals 27,876 duplicated ballots. We have the date and time that those ballots were duplicated. We have the duplication board that worked on those ballots, and we have a record, and it shows the ballot style. So in Maricopa County, we have 10,000 different ballot styles. That matches the original um, ballot style, and they're all tied together through a matching serial number. So then they go through and make additional claims that we didn't use serial numbers or that um, they were not legible um, or we duplicated serial numbers. And we find those false as well. We have a record of every serial number that we placed on a ballot. So when we go through and we duplicate a damaged ballot, we can scan that in using one of our scanners into our system, what we call the Novus system. It will spray on a marrying number in the right hand column of that ballot. And then our Nova system then assigns a duplication serial number on the top of a, the new ballot that will be duplicated, printed, and ultimately tabulated. So there's a way to tie both of those back to each other always. Now, there was a court case reference, Ward versus Jackson, where our duplication process was scrutinized. And during that process, we had, well, prior to that, we had all of our duplication, duplicated ballots or orderly and organized. And then we had to allow the plaintiffs and the defendants to come in and perform a random sample of all of our 27,000 ballots. They went through and we laid them all out in trays. And then they selected, randomly selected ballots from the center of those trays, the top of those trays, the bottom of those trays for court for those ballots to be reviewed. Well, after that court case, we did not go back and put those ballots in the order that they were originally in. So that could be one of the complicating factors um, that uh, caused the cyber ninjas not to be able to identify uh, the original duplicated ballots. Another factor is that we identified during that court case is since when we're spraying on that a uh, marrying number, and it's in the right-hand column of the ballot, sometimes it will go through the timing marks. Well, we were using black ink, and those timing marks are in black ink. So then that made it very difficult in some instances to be able to read that marrying number. So that could have been another contributing factor. However, we identified that in November of 2020, um, or in December when we went to court for that court hearing. Um, and then in the March 2020 election, we implemented a continuous improvement process where when we are spraying on now that marrying number on those original ballots, um, we identify, we make sure that it's legible. And if it's not, and there can be instances when it's not still, then we put a, a label over it, it's a white label. So when it gets rescanned through that system, 
then that marrying number is very legible. And then we've also updated our labeling process for the boxes themselves. So the, the original ballots are clearly labeled uh, and separated, and the duplicated ballots that were running through the tabulation system, we're keeping them separate from the other ballots that get tabulated so they can be easily tracked and identified married together. But that's one of the other incorrect conclusions that they make. They've said that we've commingled original ballots with duplicated ballots. And then this is their misunderstanding of uh, what a original duplicated ballot is versus a original ballot that doesn't need to be duplicated. So they've identified a original ballot that didn't need to be duplicated. They didn't go through a duplication process. It's just immediately tabulated. There's no law preventing us from uh, combining those ballots that went through the tabulation system with a ballot that ultimately gets duplicated with the marrying number. Those were combined in 2020, and there's no law that prevents that. However, moving forward, uh, we have identified a way to separate those so it would be easier if there are post-election audits like this in the future, or hopefully uh, legitimate post-election audits uh, that are uh, using objective processes and experts. Scott, is the duplication process required by law? Yes. So in layman's term, the duplication process is meant to rehabilitate damaged or stained ballots that can't be read by the tabulator, and then it's transferred onto a new ballot that can be read by the tabulator. Is that correct? That's correct. And you're suggesting that this was not the first, that Cyber Ninjas was not the first instance of an external party reviewing Maricopa County's duplication process in the November 2020 election, correct? That's correct. No, indeed it was not. In fact, again, if we go to what the Superior Court ruled and wrote, it said, quote, the duplication process for the presidential election was 99.45% accurate. And there is no evidence that the inaccuracies were intentional, intentional or part of a fraudulent scheme. They were mistakes. And given both the small number of duplicate ballots and the low error rate, the evidence does not show any impact on the outcome. So there were a, a, a tiny, de minimis amount of mistakes because this process involves humans transferring things. But to persist in suggesting that the duplication process was either unlawful or inaccurate is to ignore a direct statement from a Superior Court judge that was then affirmed unanimously by the Arizona Supreme Court. Another rhetorical question. <laughs> Correct. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Jarrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now on to the final two items in the report. Move this forward. Can you move two slides forward? Yep, thank you. So, and if you're keeping track, we've now reviewed 73 claims. All 73 have been inaccurate, uh, misleading, or what we determined false. We're now on the final two. The, those viewing at home don't see the tote board in the back, so. <laughs> Actually, we need to go back to this slide. Thanks. One more forward. So the final two claims relate to ballots. Um, and the Cyber Ninjas made one claim that we did not label as misleading, uh, inaccurate, or false. And this is related to um, double scanned and counted ballots. Uh, so we went through, they identified in, in their report and stated that there were 50 ballots that were um, double scanned and counted twice. They also in their report say that they're still doing further analysis to identify if that's possible that there were additional ones. Um, well, we went through using the cast vote record. And with the cast vote record, you can identify enough unique char characteristics, especially in Maricopa County. So in Maricopa County, we have 10,000 different ballot styles. And then when you narrow down just those 10,000 ballot styles, that some of those ballots have 60 to 70 different contests and you can look at the way voters vote. And then the cast vote record also shows us how much of the oval 
is filled in, we can go through and identify, are there any similarities between those? It almost creates like a unique fingerprint for each ballot. And so we did that analysis to identify if it was possible that there were 50 um, ballots that were double scanned and double counted. We identified that there were 137 ballots that had those unique characteristics. We then did a comparison of the images for those different ballots and we did identify that there were 50 ballots that were inadvertently um, scanned twice and counted and included in the canvas. Now, we determined that this was just an honest mistake that the tabulation operator, as they went through this process, they set them aside and then accidentally rescanned them a second time. So this is the one claim that we did not assign a misleading, inaccurate, or false factor. But there was one other associated where the Cyber Ninjas identified, and this goes back to, and is related to duplicated ballots. They stated that we combined duplicated ballots, or the original duplicated ballots, with the originally tabulated ballots on our manifest that we delivered to the Senate. And we find that claim inaccurate. Um, we went through and identified that there are absolutely no instances where we, that we commingled original duplicated ballots with the ballots that were tabulated. There were instances where we combined a duplicated ballot that was tabulated with a ballot that didn't need to go through tab duplication, but was also tabulated. And again, no laws preventing that. So the final summary is, if you're keeping track of the number of uh, questionable ballots questionable ballots or ballots that where a voter may have possibly double voted or a deceased voter may have uh, had their ballot cast. Uh, we are t counting 37 of those plus the 50 instances where we made an inadvertent error where we double scanned and counted ballots. So a total of 87 instances where the Cyber Ninjas reported over 53,000. So a significant difference. So we when you look at this, we view our results as are the certified results, the results that we would rely on for the November 2020 election, what were certified and canvassed by the board, what were transmitted to the Secretary of State's office, because we use reliable processes, secure processes, transparent processes, accurate. Uh, we use election experts to review our, our processes. We hire election experts. We hire bipartisan boards versus misleading, inaccurate, false, using procedures with lack of expertise, lack of knowledge of election laws, and not having bipartisan uh, staff performing their review of the audit. One other thing I wanna note is, and it's been brought up several times through the course of this presentation, we do believe in continuous improvement. We're always looking to improve and refine our processes. And we've discussed some of those here today with you. Um, we're adding additional security, even within our ballot tabulation center. We have restricted access. We, uh, it is an air gap system. Uh, we've implemented our exposed wiring. We used those exposed wiring. We have specific colors that go to specific pieces of equipment, so it's very evident. But we're also adding additional security about using serial numbers, our port blockers with unique serial numbers that only we have the key to be able to remove those port blockers. Um, we used to use just port blockers that didn't have that specific key. So adding those additional requirements, our security protocols within our operations, there's just one way we're improving, in addition to the ones that we've already covered today. So with that, that concludes our presentation and we open it up to any questions from the board. Excellent, report. thank you so much. Uh, do we have, I would like to give everyone up here an opportunity to kind of make a closing statement. So before that, do you guys have questions for our panel? Just a quick uh, question because we were calling out things and that's a, that was a important piece. Another, uh, a mistake uh, was made by an employee. Um, we need to, we need to call out the good, the bad, the ugly. And, um, a mistake of 50 ballots scanned back in. And I know the way the county reacts with mistakes. I'm sure you've probably found out even what day it was, maybe who did it. Um, is that person a, a traditional or a, a, an employee of Maricopa County year round, 
uh, that made that mistake? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman, as with all of our processes, um, we don't have enough full-time staff, so we have to hire temporary workers, um, not only to work at our voting locations, but to work in our central boards, as well as to assist with tabulation. So this was one of our temporary workers that we hired. So just what labor, what we're all finding out that own businesses, you know, it labor's tough. And then in this heightened environment, I remember calling out to the community, calling out to the county, can anyone help us? It's a pandemic. Um, I remember the county staffers at the very first of the pandemic during the presidential preference election, keeping an eye on a drop box and standing way away in a in mass that were hard to find at that point. And um, I get to meet her and, and talk to her, but that's a that's a job she didn't usually do. Uh, she actually she worked on the road on a road crew. So she gave, did her civic duty that day, answering our call, our board's call to come in and work these elections. And this description of what you just said, uh, basically a temporary worker. Uh, but what I'd like to know is, um, are the standards even with that? I mean, this is, this is a feeding ballots and could be classified somehow. They are so important. That, that vote is so important. And what, what we're talking about right now is so important by the vote. But there's two million. And th this is a person eventually feeding paper into a machine and trying to do it right. Has there been a new, are we going to have a new standard just how important this is? Is it, the, is it 50 at a time? Is it 25 at a time that go into a blue file? And, um, so go ahead and answer that one because I'm gonna bring it back about what we've learned. So Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman, yes, we've added additional um, logging requirements on our logs. So at the end of every shift, we're performing additional reviews more than what we were doing um, before in the November 2020 election, which would identify this issue in the future. Okay, I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, I keep putting everything back into what my business is. Um, our, our machines, our machines run 10 million little white things a day through the machines. And pretty soon, it's not even done by humans anymore. You get snow blind, now it's done by cameras and automation. What you're talking, a human task that's still important of 50 thin white things going into a, into a machine and, and doing it right, because it is, it is by hand and we, we take it seriously. Um, I was just reading a book lately and it talked about what happened in another state and I caught my attention because if, if you guys can recall, Bill and Jack, uh, during my chairman's address, I said, we are going to run three great elections. That's the simple thing that I wanna, wanna pull off. Um, and we did, I mean, we, we did. And it's, we're, getting, we're getting this kind of stuff and slowly and slowly, we're gonna be vindicated for this and I'm gonna be able to put, push back and say, we did treat the general election as the Super Bowl and our people performed magnificently. So I'm taking it back though, because what I said, if you can recall, Scott, let's use the presidential pre uh, preference election. We found out some things uh, that occurred during the start of a pandemic that we put into the primary and then we, found out some things and made some mistakes and made uh, did some processes to put it into the general. And I speak specifically on one that was called out in the canvas, which was in the primary, there was some poll workers that left behind thumb drives at different locations. We're not talking about that today. We're not talking about that as part of a conspiracy or somebody making a mistake, because you put standards and practices in and it didn't happen for the general. Well, guess what? It happened in another state. There was 40 thumb drives left back at primary things in another state. And I'm reading this book and going, what did they learn in the general? And you know what? This huge story still wraps itself around those 40 thumb drives that were le left back. So I just wanted to thank you because this group has done phenomenal of what we learned just what I asked for. What we learn in what some elections will need to transpire and fix all the way to this one. And this is, again, 
just th this ma mistake or two being called out means this process, there will be a new process to try to keep, keep a mistake from happening. But elections are so human. We need it to be human. We need a human component about these elections. We need paper ballots forevermore so we can track what Stephen is saying. I, I just learned that lesson uh, with this one. So I guess I could say that's my, that's my ending statement. I'll, I'll make my ending statement and then you guys can ask questions because I thought this was important. I thought I should just write it down. No election is perfect, but what our report confirms in the November 2020 general election in Maricopa County is about as close as you can get. A record number of people participated. Their votes were counted and they were cast using proven processes and both Republicans and Democrats won local and statewide races. If one of your preferred candidates or causes lost in 2020, that is not proof of fraud. That's proof of democracy working. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Hickman. Uh, any other questions before we kind of segue into closing statements? Recorder Richer. Closing? Yes. Well, first, thanks for your indulgence throughout the day. I appreciate it. I assume this is this is my first time on the dais. I assume my last time, <laughs> but I I really appreciate it. Uh, I have the best colleagues. And it's not just these four, it's also Supervisor Gallardo listening on the phone, and it's the rest of the county elected team, and it's the people I work with, and I think today was um, a reflection of that. I grew up on Harry Potter, so I have to say the book is always better than the movie, so I really recommend you read the report that we talked about today, not just watch the video. Um, and then if you don't mind, I will uh, I'll say a few things, but I won't be too, too. Please long. do. All right, so today is actually my one year and one day anniversary from when I took office. I didn't have any fanfare the day I took office. I didn't have a swearing in ceremony, actually. I didn't talk to the media for the first five months. I just got to work. Throughout 2021, the elections department, the recorder's office, and I have worked our butts off to faithfully execute our statutory responsibilities. I think everyone here can attest that my silver Nissan Rogue with a very small Richard for recorder sign and a Deathly Hallows sticker in the is in the garage early, late, and often. As a team in 2021, we recorded over 1.3 million documents. We registered over 100,000 new voters. We made over 100,000 voting record changes, and we ran three uneventful, which is to say successful, elections. We shortened our average public records response time from a matter of months to a matter of days. We provided never before released election statistics. We processed multiple state and municipal initiatives. We launched a new premium poll worker training program. We added new vote tracking features. We also made many internal improvements, personnel changes, personnel additions, including two of the people in front of you, and physical plant changes that I know will better equip us for the years to come. We, of course, also spent thousands thousands of hours reviewing the November 2020 election and responding to allegations concerning that election. I don't begrudge most of the time spent on the November 2020 election. It has afforded me a knowledge of the election system that would have otherwise been impossible to gain in just one year. And that knowledge lets me say the following with supreme confidence. Maricopa County's November 2020 election was conducted fairly, lawfully and accurately. The elected officials who are now in office, whether it's Democrat U.S. Senator Mark Kelly or Republican State Senator J.D. Mesnard, were duly elected and have the authority imbued in them by the democratic process. I have known this for some time. However, there is still a minority portion of Arizona but a significant portion of my party who continue to have broad doubts about our elections. These people are our constituents as well, and they don't have access to all of the information I get to see on a daily basis. I'm hopeful that today's presentation and written report shares that information and answers those doubts for anyone who actually wants to know the truth. As the Cyber Ninjas noted in almost every question they raised, there are, quote, likely legitimate answers 
and indeed there are. Where legitimate questions were raised, we have provided answers. But providing answers is only part of the puzzle. In a recent article written by David French, he noted two common reasons why words fall on deaf ears. First, the listener perceives you as the wrong speaker. Or second, the listener perceives you as having the wrong priorities. I'm hopeful that I'm neither of these things with respect to the doubting members of my party. I hope I'm the right speaker. I'm a Republican. I wasn't in office in November 2020. I was merely a candidate one of only two Republicans in the entire county to unseat an incumbent Democrat in that election. My actions here today and this year can't reasonably be accused of being the effort of a self-interested cover-up. I've volunteered for over 20 Republican campaigns. I've worked at and been part of the entire parade of right-of-center organizations, including American Enterprise Institute, Cato Institute, and the Federalist Society. I campaigned alongside my friends on Donald Trump's Arizona team. I voted for Donald Trump. I hope I can also convince doubting Republicans that I have the right priorities. I'm not the type of recorder who thinks it's my mission to heal the world by making sure voter turnout is the highest it's ever been. I'm in this office to make sure things are run competently, fairly, and lawfully. If you want to vote, I want you to have a positive voting experience. But I also want to make sure that vote is lawful and that if the law is broken, there are consequences. To this end, just yesterday, my office delivered another batch of voting records to the Attorney General for investigation into possible voting fraud by individual actors, nobody within Maricopa County. This was the result of a new process that we initiated and that county staff spent many hours executing. This number is in addition to the many voter files that we have already helped the Attorney General investigate this year. I don't think more election investigations have ever been driven in one year than the year we just had under this Attorney General, this Board of Supervisors, and this Recorder. My interest in election integrity has also prompted me to engage with state legislators about possible improvements to our election systems and laws. I appreciate Senator Townsend, Speaker Bowers, Representative Toma, Representative Osborne, and Representative John for recently taking the time to visit our facilities and talk elections. And I look forward to meeting with the over 20 Republican and Democrat state legislators who are touring our facilities in the next two weeks. As a longtime Republican who cares about election integrity, I hope that I, my team, and this report can convince you that I'm a trustworthy speaker and that if I had found any evidence of a stolen election, the conversation today would be playing out very differently. But the truth is, is that the Maricopa County 2020 election wasn't stolen from Donald Trump. The truth is exactly what our chief law enforcement officer, Attorney General Mark Brnovich, said previously to Fox News, and I quote, people voted for Republicans down ballot who didn't vote for President Trump or Martha McSally. That's the reality, end quote. That's still reality. That statement is supported by local law enforcement officers and prosecutors all the way from President Trump's United States Attorney General Bill Barr, his Deputy Attorney General Jeff Rosen, and his Cybersecurity Director Chris Krebs. It has been backed in our state courts, it has been backed in our federal courts, and Governor Ducey. Now my office is moving forward. We're done. In 2022, we hope to make significant improvements to our voter registration and recording processes. And we have four elections to run, candidate signature challenges to administer, and initiatives to process. I can't possibly ask my team to do all of that and to continue to commit hundreds of hours to the November 2020 election. Speaking of my team, this is the whole reason I'm here, I have to remind everyone of the human components of elections. For many, this is just a political game, one in which you can score points and get new Twitter followers. For others, this is an opportunity, one in which you can create a national platform for saying crazy things or raise money or even get paid millions of dollars without having any of the ordinarily recommending qualifications. But for me, as was probably evident today, this is personal. Every day I work alongside 160 normal Arizonans. During election seasons, our team has grown with thousands of other normal Arizonans. As I have said in this auditorium before, they are good people, they are hardworking people, they are humble people, they are Arizonans, 
They are potentially your constituents. They are my colleagues and they are my friends. So when you talk about perp walks, incarceration, nooses, guillotines, executions, solitary confinement, decapitation, rape, or any of the other unpleasant things that have been leveled at this office by people ranging from anonymous haters to yes, elected officials, please keep in mind that you're talking about real people, real Arizonans, and if you're an elected official, your constituents. I appeal to your sense of goodness and honesty, whether as a result of your faith or moral code, and ask you to not be part of the perpetuation of this unpleasantness. In closing, I'll just say to my team that I know that the last year has been challenging. I know that you all have worked hard, even working through the recent Christmas and New Year's holidays. I'm grateful to Scott, Nate, Janine, and Celia for presenting today, and I'm grateful to everyone in the Elections Department and Recorder's Office. Please keep sticking with me in 2022. I think 2022 is gonna be a great year, and I think we're gonna do great things for Maricopa County. Thank you, Recorder Richer, for your words. You're welcome up here anytime, <laughs> for the record, and you have a fantastic team. Thank you so much. Supervisor Galvin. Thank you, Chairman Gates. Um, first of all, I just want to congratulate Mr. Richer and thank him for his passion and for his leadership at the recorder's office. As you can hear from his speech just now, um, he cares a lot about his colleagues and he cares a lot about his political party and he cares a lot about his state and his country. And I tip my hat off to you. Thank you so much for being such a valuable asset today at this hearing. I also want to thank the four of you here from his department. Um, I am so immensely impressed by your presentations today. I said that a little bit earlier. Um, I always knew the elections department was just world class, but this has just been fantastic. And I really hope that people really learn a lot from what you had to say today and what you've been doing. This document here is called Correcting the Record, Maricopa County's In-Depth Analysis of the Senate Inquiry. But to me, this is really about the Maricopa County Elections Department. It's not about cyber ninjas or cypher or echo mail. And frankly, I hope not to hear those names ever again. I hope we run to them to the ash heap of history. I really do. Um, to me, 2020 is over, but 2022 is gonna be great because you guys do a great job. Um, I just want the people of Maricopa County to know that this election is gonna be reliable, secure, transparent, and accurate because it's already been done that way before. So you guys are doing a great job. Ms. Petty, Ms. Nabor, Mr. Jarrett, Mr. Young, thank you so much. And I just wanna say on behalf of my colleagues here today that we're gonna be working alongside with you and we're very proud of you. Um, and also I just wanna to say to the residents of Maricopa County, it's you, you who that matter, the 2.6 million registered voters who expect us to help you. Um, to me, the Constitution of the United States is a treasured document, but it's only words in black and white, and it's really about the people, the bedrock of election workers who really are the underpinning of our Constitution. And so this is a very important day. I'm gonna read this again um, several times because it is fantastic. You learn a lot from it. And so I just wanna thank you and I wanna thank everyone here. And um, Mr. Rich is correct, it's gonna be a great year. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Supervisor Galvin. Supervisor Sellers. Thank you, Chairman. And I, I will be brief, it's been a long day. But you know, I, I can't help but start by talking about what a great group we have in elections. We won national awards for the work you've done and I also, because we, we did the 2020 election during a pandemic and had to, to interface with a lot of our, our legislature and, and other people to make changes, to be able to make it a safe, healthy election, uh, involved our legal staff a lot and they did outstanding work for us as well. I, I just can't tell you uh, how proud I am of all of you for what you've done for Maricopa County and, and how sorry I am that you've had to tolerate all the silliness that we've been through. But the last thing I'll mention is that I had the opportunity to, to tour our elections operations twice. The last time with the recorder and two of our representatives during an actual election being processed. And I left that, and our representatives left that as well, saying anybody who saw what we saw and got the answers to the questions that we ask would never, ever 
question the quality, the fairness, and the integrity of our elections processes. So thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Sellers. Uh, look, my, my thought after viewing, after listening to this presentation and hearing from all of you is you guys are credible. You're professionals. And I'm so proud to be affiliated with each and every one of you. And I hope that you pass that on to everyone that you work with. Uh, this is about you. It's about the workers. It's about our voters. And I feel like in this presentation today and in the written report, you have taken and you have debunked. We had that we have the tote board in the back. You have debunked over and over the, the statements that were made in the Cyber Ninja report. And that's important for people to understand that. And if they didn't have the opportunity to watch this presentation today, I really do hope they do what Supervisor Galvin's gonna do and review this again. And I'm gonna review it again as well. And I think it's important that our legislators not create new election law based upon the Cyber Ninja report. It's been debunked and it was written by people who are not experts in the field. We were fortunate enough to have Helen Purcell join us many, many hours ago in another, uh, another hearing. And the comment was made about the credibility that she always had. And, and my feeling is, all of you, you stand on her shoulders, but you have that same type of credibility. And I know that you will be vindicated through history. And I know that those who are serious legislators and serious lawmakers are gonna listen to you and you can uh, count on the fact that we will all continue to listen to you, look to you for your guidance. But I would agree with what uh, Recorder Richer said a few minutes ago, we're done. We're done. This is the end of the 2020 election. We have addressed the issues. We have debunked them. If there are lies, we will respond to those lies. But otherwise, we're moving on. We've got elections to run in 2022. And I look forward to working with everyone here on that effort. Thank you to everyone for your time today. And this meeting is adjourned.